concludes portfolio questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion 5479 in the name of Anas Arwar on scrap the NHS pay cap. I would ask all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Anas Arwar to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, the Scottish Parliament has the opportunity to unite in support of Scotland's NHS staff. We should take that opportunity. Every single day, our amazing NHS staff are performing miracles. There is the caring, the examinations, the diagnoses, the treatments, the operations, the saving of lives and the delivering of newborns. But there are also the parts that are easily forgotten or not recorded by a statistic. Giving advice, holding hands, sharing tears of grief and joy, comforting those that have lost loved ones. Simply put, just being there and caring. We all have our own personal stories of how the NHS has touched us. We all have our own family or friends who have worked for the greatest public institution in the UK. And uh, just by coincidence, Parading Officer, this debate falls on the first birthday of my youngest son. Um, this time last year was the culmination of probably the biggest emotional roller coaster that I have ever personally been on. Within the space of a week, I had welcomed the birth of my beautiful niece, only for her heart to stop the next day, and after days of battling for us to sadly lose her. The next day, to being elected to this parliament, and then a few days later, the birth of my own son, part joy, but also part guilt for the tragedy that my own brother and sister-in-law were going through. I can honestly say, hand on heart, that if it wasn't for the love and care of the neonatal nurses and the midwives, my family and I couldn't have got through that week. So to all our NHS staff, the porters, the nurses, the midwives, the doctors, the consultants, the allied health professionals, and all the rest, thank you. Thank you for caring. Because what we should never forget is that it's not the buildings, the medicines, the equipment, the treatments that make our NHS great. It's the brilliant people that work for our NHS. But our thank yous are not enough. They should be respected and rewarded for the job that they do too. Because goodwill and dedication to the NHS and their patients only goes so far. And that's why the context of today's debate is so important. A record number of vacancies in all parts of Scotland's NHS. GP vacancies, consultant vacancies, midwife vacancies, nursing vacancies, and more. And just take that last example on nursing vacancies. More than 2,500 nursing staff missing from our hospitals across Scotland. Since 2011, the number of vacancies has increased from 660 to 2,500 four times the number in only six years. And of those vacancies, the number going unfilled for more than three months has increased 300% and now sits at almost 750. With nursing staff themselves reporting that they don't have the right number of colleagues to be able to do the job properly. The Royal College of Nurses centenary survey of its members in 2016 showed that staffing levels were their biggest concern that they just don't feel there's enough of them to care for their patients. And without the right number of nursing staff, patients simply do not get the care they need, whether that is in hospital, at home, or in a care setting. Nursing staff want to do their very best for patients, but their best efforts are often coming up against the reality of pressures on the workforce. In short, presiding officer, too few nurses doing too much work for too little reward under-resourced, understaffed, and under pressure, and clearly underpaid. Underpaid by this Scottish Government that has the ability to do something about it. Underpaid by the Government who need to recognise the impact that their austerity is having on the recruitment, retention, and morale of Scotland's nurses. I met with some of Scotland's nurses this morning. I want to give just two examples. Graham who has been in service for 32 years, told me that this was the lowest morale among staff ever. In his words, goodwill only goes so far, 
Goodwill doesn't pay the bills. Or Ellie, one of the trainee nurses, who told me about staff having to step in to do shifts on bank shifts, to do roles that they shouldn't be doing as trainees. Others told me about nurses having to take second jobs or even sh shamefully having to attend food banks. NHS staff having to attend food banks. So let me set out what this government's policy of austerity means for Scotland's nurses. This is independent analysis done by SPICE. Pay at the starting point of Band 5 has increased by 6% over the period April 2010 to 2017. Over the same period, prices as measured by the Retail's Price Index have increased by 22%. This means that Band 5 starting point pay has fallen by 13% in real terms over the period. That's the equivalent to a reduction of £3,400. Happy to take an intervention. Ivan McKee. Thank, thank the member for taking an intervention and um, just reflecting on his figures. I went and asked Spice about those, uh, those very figures and the answer that they gave me was a nurse starting on Band 5 in April 2010 who progressed up one point per year would now be on a salary of £29,033 as of April 2017. That's more than £3,000 than the member suggested. Cash increase of 37% and a real terms increase of 12%. Does the member recognise those figures? In our what I would say to Ivan McKee is uh, we're talking about starting salaries and that doesn't take into account the progressions. And I'm more than happy because we are publishing uh, the SPICE analysis in order to say that. Now, what I, now what I don't understand is uh, already the SNP benches are jumping to have an argument about numbers and bands when I have laid out in the own words of staff about the experiences they're having on staff, and I don't think they will appreciate. I don't think they will appreciate. Sorry, Mr. Starwell. Point of order from Mr. Doris. Can, can I ask you, President Officer, what recourse of action any member in the course of the debate who may be mi misleading Parliament, whether deliberate or otherwise, to correct the factual situation at its earliest opportunity? In reference to Mr. Sarwar. I think all members know the rules of this Parliament. Mr. Sarwar, continue, please. I, I, I think Mr. Doris should perhaps reflect on how. His intervention and perhaps that of the SNP benches reflects on the NHS staff who will be watching this debate. So is it any wonder that we have record levels of vacancies, record levels of sickness absence and a vacancy crisis in Scotland's NHS? But while on the one hand the Scottish Government are overseeing the vacancy crisis, they are on the other hand paying hundreds of millions of pounds out every year to private nursing agencies. In the past year, Audit Scotland confirmed that right across the NHS, £175 million has been spent on private agencies. £175 million of cash going on agencies when Audit Scotland report, and I quote, agency staff are likely to be more expensive than bank nurses and also pose a greater potential risk to patient safety and the quality of care. It makes no sense at all for the Cabinet Secretary to be throwing money at private agencies while starving the NHS of cash to resolve the vacancy crisis. And the verdict of the Royal College of Nursing has been damning. Nursing leaders are clear, and again I will quote directly from them. Budget savings achieved through pay restraint are being used to meet efficiency saving targets for the NHS. They go on, the result is that NHS staff pay has fallen way behind the cost of living and many nursing staff are now struggling to survive on their pay packet. And worryingly, they go on, it is negatively impacting on the quality of care being delivered to patients. This is what SNP members should be really reflecting on. This is happening in Scotland. This is happening in 2017. Nurses in Scotland's NHS, on the watch of an SNP government and an SNP cabinet secretary, struggling to survive on their pay packet. I want to repeat that. Nurses in Scotland struggling to survive on their pay packet. The RCN's most recent employment survey of members found that almost one in three struggled to pay gas and electricity bills. It found that one in seven had missed meals because of their financial difficulties. More than half reported that they were compelled to work extra hours to increase earnings. And one in three 
were working shifts at night and weekends to help pay bills and meet everyday living expenses. The RCN Career Service has seen a marked increase in calls from members with families seeking advice on career options outside of the nursing profession, often citing pay restraint and the increasingly limited opportunities for skilled and experienced nurses for progress in their careers. Happy Emma, to take intervention. Emma Harper. Um, the RCN membership survey is actually a membership survey of the RCN in the whole of the UK and not just Scotland. I would wonder if you would care to comment on that. And I, 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 thank, I thank the member for that intervention. I have already said that I met nurses in Scotland this morning who reflected on the same experience that has been come across from members right across the UK. Pay restraint has had an impact in Scotland. And I would say to Emma Harper, having been a nurse, I would expect you to understand acutely about the struggles and strains of the NHS staff right across the country. And I would hope, as a former member of a union, as a qualified nurse, that she would be voting in favour of a pay increase for nurses today. Because this is not the Labour Party re reporting these facts. These are damning facts reported by nurses. Many are taking second jobs. Some of them are using food banks to feed their families. This is happening in Scotland. This is happening in 2017. And I note that the Scottish Government amendment calls for an assessment of pay restraint. I say to the Cabinet Secretary, the RCN, Unison and others are already telling us the consequences of pay restraint. And, Presiding Officer, the only people responsible are the Scottish Government, in control of every aspect of Scotland's NHS for a decade. The First Minister herself in control and who took decisions that we're now reaping the consequences of, like the decision to cut the number of student nursing places. Indeed, there was strong criticism by Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP government to splash the number of training places for nurses and midwives by nearly 300 in 2012-2013. But how did the First Minister react at the time? And I quote again directly from the First Minister. A reduction in intake for the 2012 academic year is a sensible way forward. How she must regret those words today. So today, Presiding Officer, this Parliament can unite and send a message to Scotland's NHS staff. We can tell them loudly and clearly, you are our most valuable asset. You do make the difference. We recognise how important the work you do is. We do respect you and you will be rewarded. That's why our motion is clear, to scrap the pay cap and actually give the NHS staff a pay increase they deserve. Not the alternative, which is to carry on with more austerity and more cuts. And that's why the choice is clear, presiding officer. Focus on a Labour motion that will give an NHS a pay rise it deserves, or focus on the SNP's obsession only with running another independence referendum. Thank you. I now call on Shona Robson to speak to and move the motion in her name. Thank you, President Officer. I'm very happy to take part in this debate and move the amendment in my name. As Health Secretary, I have the good fortune to regularly see the excellent work that our health service staff do day in and day out. The men and women uh, provide care to every family in our country, working to ensure that Scotland is as healthy as possible and that our health service is first class. And I know I'm not alone in this chamber and would agree with Anna Sauer on this point that they've not only the, the thanks of my uh, family, but the thanks of us all. Uh, in my opening remarks, I want to focus uh, my remarks mainly around the issue of pay. I will return to the issue of workforce levels, of which, of course, we have uh, record workforce levels, although we have record uh, demands on our health service. And I'll come back to that and the issue of agency spend in my closing uh, remarks. The independent pay review process in the NHS can trace its origins back to the 1980s. And it's the independent NHS pay review body which considers and then makes recommendations that advise all four countries on the uplifts that should be applied. <coughs> With staff representatives, we've uh, valued the independent pay review process to date. 
In Scotland, we've been clear in our view that ours are annual settlements. However, there continues to be a, a challenge to this process as the UK Treasury has in recent years insisted that pay restraint of 1% uplifts will be maintained till, until at least 2020. In turn, the UK Government's Department of Health for England has adopted this approach, supported by Labour-run Wales. The Welsh Government has agreed that they also intend to apply the 1% restriction until 2020. So perhaps an example of Labour saying one thing during an election campaign and doing an entirely different thing when they're in government and have the power to pay nurses. Yes, of course. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. Can she confirm that her own submission to the independent peer review body recommended continuing a 1% pay cap for Scotland's NHS staff? Can she confirm that? Our, our pay policy is in the context of not just addressing uh, the pay uplift, but of course low pay and indeed the no compulsory redundancy policy. But as the RCN themselves have recognised, we are all bound by the Treasury because what the Treasury gives in terms of the, the resources to the Department of Health is exactly what we get in consequentials. So I'll come back to the issue of the pay review body uh, in a second. But another aspect of where our approach has differed from elsewhere is that we've consistently applied the recommendations of that pay review body as well as taking additional action to help the lowest paid. The result of this is that we've seen a steady divergence in recent years where Agenda for Change staff in Scotland are better paid than their counterparts in England, Wales and Northern Ireland because we're the only country to apply the full pay review body recommendations in 2014. We're the only country to even request recommendations in 2015. Our staff are now paid more than their colleagues undertaking the same duties in those other parts of the UK. As the government amendment notes, nurses in the first pay point of Agenda for Change Band 5 are now paid £312 more than their counterparts in Wales and England. In fact, at every pay point within Band 5, staff in Scotland are paid between 1% and 2% more than their counterparts in Wales and England. And a band five nurse who started on the first pay point in 2010 and progressed annually within it will have started, yes, on 21,176, but will have advanced to £29,034 now. Based on Labour's own analysis, that would be a real terms increase of over 12% or 37% in cash terms. So as the unions recognise, it's not just about pay, it's also about pay progression. And I'll come back to that point uh, in a second. In a minute. And of course, there is the real job security that we've been able to bring. It's been this government, with the support of Parliament, that has delivered our no compulsory redundancy policy since 2007. I know this commitment is valued highly by NHS Scotland staff and compares favourably favourably to the likes of the more than 20,000 compulsory redundancies that have taken place in the NHS in England since 2010. But the difference with our approach in Scotland to elsewhere is even more pronounced when you look at the position of the lowest paid workers in the NHS. By delivering the real living wage for a number of years, by ensuring additional uplifts for the lowest paid above those recommended by the review body, and by working in partnership with unions such as Unison uh, to provide upskilling for previously banned one staff. We now have entry-level support staff in Scotland being paid over £1,100 more than their opposite numbers in NHS England. For these dedicated, hard-working NHS support staff who are helping the delivery healthcare to the people of Scotland, I know these additional amounts can make a real difference. However, there are clearly staff who have reached the top of their bands for whom inflationary pressures will have outpaced their uplift, and while staff at the top of their bands are relatively better off than those in England and Wales, I know that they face real challenges given those inflationary pressures. The Scottish Government... Yes, briefly. John Smith. The Cabinet Secretary rightly highlights that those at the top of the pay band will, in real terms, be worse off year on year that we have this pay cap. But we should also confirm that a nurse starting today is £3,400 worse off in real terms than a nurse starting in April 2010. Secretary. Nurses in Scotland are over £300 better off at the starting point of Band 5 than anywhere else in these islands, including in Labour-run 
Wales. And of course, no one stays on point one of their band. Labour seem to misunderstand and not understand the way pay progression works. It is about pay and pay progression. And those nurses starting at the point one in 2010 will now be £7,500 better off because they would have worked through that scale. But the Scottish Government, alongside NHS employers and the staff side, work together at all levels to deliver the outstanding health service that we all use and rely on. And we greatly value the insight, advice and sometimes the necessary challenge that the NHS Scotland unions and staff bodies bring. So I look forward to meeting with the RCN, Unison and others to discuss pay over the next few weeks. And in fact, I met Unison uh, health staff earlier uh, today. And what was interesting about what one of the nurses was telling me was that yes, pay and the pay increase and the, the, the percentage of pay increase is one element and is important, but equally important is pay progression, is seniority pay, is recognition for uh, continued professional development and training. Uh, and all of those issues are equally as important. And those are the issues that I will address in my meeting uh, with the union. So not a promise of jam tomorrow from a party that has no prospect of winning the general election, but real action in the here and now, working with the unions in partnership to address these issues. Our constructive approach to partnership working was also evident during the recent negotiations to effectively do away with the lowest band one level in NHS Scotland and move the staff on to better pay and more rewarding roles. Again, not promises of something tomorrow, but something uh, today. Partnership with staff is always the best way to resolve issues. I can confirm today that I've written to the staff side representatives to arrange to meet and discuss a, to jointly commission work to develop an evidence base that will help us assess the impact of pay restraint that can be used in the next round of submissions to the independent NHS pay review bodies. No, I'm in my last minute. And one thing I would say to the unions, uh, no, I said I won't because I'm in my last minute. In conclusion, uh, we believe that there can continue to be value in the independent pay review process, but we are willing to explore alternative approaches if that is in the best interests of NHS staff. Bearing in mind it was the unions, many of whom wanted the independent pay review process, if they are now saying that they think that has run its course and the unions want to engage with me on looking at a different set of pay negotiation structures, perhaps Scottish pay negotiation structures, then I have made clear to the unions on many occasions that my door is open to that, that that has to be with the staff side agreement. So that is something I will put on the table to discuss with the unions within the NHS whether or not they want to maintain the independent pay review body process or whether they want to move forward in a different way. We will move forward working with the NHS staff in partnership to deliver Scottish solutions that work for the benefit of all of our hard-working NHS staff. Thank you. I now call on Donald Cameron to speak to and move the, motion in, the amendment in his name. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this debate today is about the priority and choices for our National Health Service. Do we want a strong NHS that is able to cope with rising demand, an ageing population and the pressures placed on its staff? Or must we have an NHS that is unable to handle the heat with plummeting staff morale, longer waiting times and longer waits for appointments? Nobody in this chamber would opt for the latter. However, the record of this SNP government will inevitably lead to the very issues that we want to avoid. This government has been in power for more than 10 years now and has had full control of the direction of the NHS during that time. And what is their record? Significant staff vacancies, nursing and, in nursing and midwifery and consultants in allied health professions, people waiting well over the 18-week target for referral to treatment, and a failure to meet waiting time targets in accident and emergency with only seven out of 52 weeks met last year. And most pertinently in this, de in this debate, yes, certainly. Cabinet Secretary. Has Donald Cameron recently looked at the relative ADE performance of our departments in Scotland compared to Tory-run NHS England? It is night and day. A quarter of NHS a &E departments in England were in crisis over the winter, something not seen here in Scotland. Will he please pay due recognition to the hard-working efforts of our a &E staff that have delivered the best performance in the UK? Donald Cameron. 
We have been here many times before, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is an SNP government that runs the Scottish Health Service. They should concentrate on their record and not point the finger at other places. Most pertinently in this debate, plummeting staff morale is present, with almost half of NHS staff feeling that they were unable to do their jobs properly because they were overworked. This is a depressing record for an SNP government who regularly like to trumpet that they are the only party who can deliver for the NHS. And it's a record I'll come back to in a moment. But let me first address the issue of Brexit, which appears in the government amendment. And I'd like to deal with this head on, given its prominence in the media today, and it was mentioned earlier in portfolio questions. Now, it's difficult to estimate the number of NHS employees from non-UK EU countries. We know that in terms of the NHS, it's approximately 5 to 10%. So undoubtedly, Brexit presents a challenge. And the UK government has been very clear. One of the government's top priorities as part of the Brexit negotiations is to secure the rights of EU nationals to continue to live and work in the UK. But I've said it before and I will say it again, the serious issues in NHS staffing in Scotland did not suddenly begin on the 23rd of June 2016 when the UK voted to leave the EU. GP shortages have been in existence long before then. So the SNP cannot use Brexit as cover for the existing workforce crisis. We, we are going to, I want to carry on, we are going to be 820 odd GPs short by 2021. Many staff are close to retirement. Those that are left are overworked and under immense pressure. The health workforce in Scotland is in crisis due to nearly a decade of SNP mismanagement. And it is, let's not hear the SNP blame Brexit for their own problems or use it as a reason not to take responsibility. Turning to Labour's motion, now I have huge sympathy with the feelings and motivations behind this motion. We all want our NHS staff to be properly paid, but at this point in time, these benches cannot support an end to the cap, partly due to tight budgets and multiple rising budgetary pressures. We believe that for the time being, staff should continue to receive a 1% pay rise and should be supported in other non-financial ways. If we are to secure the long-term future of the NHS, we should instead be ensuring that the short staffing problems which pervade the health service are addressed as a matter of urgency. Yes. Anna Sarwar. The member for taking intervention, but surely that extra support shouldn't be food banks. Surely there has to be a recognition that there's a direct correlation between staff vacancies, staff morale, patient outcomes and staff pay. Surely even the Tories can see that. Donald Cameron. I accept that hard-working NHS staff deserve to be paid well as they do skilled and vital jobs. And I welcome, indeed I welcome the government's commitment to ensure that all staff are paid the living wage. And we acknowledge that the Scottish Government has passed on recommended pay increases and that staff in Scotland, in the NHS, are paid more than in other UK countries. However, as I've said, the NHS is facing rising demands with an ageing population and complex health needs. Any decision to increase pay has to be taken in a wider context. Despite the pay cap, staff costs still increased by 6.4% in the last five years. And staff costs make up nearly half of all NHS operating costs. If we manage to reform the NHS in order to continue to deliver high quality healthcare and truly shift the balance of care away from the acute services into the community, then we would be able to invest what we save. Labour have come to this chamber today with an important issue, a very important issue, but they have made no mention or, or give any, have given any detail of the cost of what they are proposing. They haven't said how it's... Yes, indeed. Neil Finlay. In the NHS, there are huge vacancy rates. We can't get people to take up posts, and yet the member is arguing for a cap of 1%. In this place, there are no vacancies. There are armies of people outside would be desperate to take up our posts, no gaps, and yet he will agree to an increased pay, uh, pay level than he is for nurses that will be paid to him and die. Is that fair? Donald Cameron. Well, the point that I make to Mr Finlay is you have given no details of how much this is going to cost. How is it going to be funded? The UK Labour has estimated that every 1% extra on pay will cost the NHS £350 million. However, other figures suggest it could be higher. So Labour may want to supply some figures, though perhaps not by consulting with Diane Abbott this time. 
D Deputy Presiding Officer, while the Labour motion doesn't address one of the central issues that face our NHS, we must address staffing levels. We know that staff morale is low, and we have seen time and time again that low morale is down to the fact that there are severe staff shortages across the NHS, which this SNP government has failed. No, I've taken several interventions I need to, to crack on. The SNP government have completely failed to tackle. We know that the most recent figures show that. We've quoted the number of consultant posts vacant, the number of nursing and midwifery posts that are vacant. Time and time again, the government has ignored our warnings and even have ignored the warnings of the very consistent calls from the professional bodies which show us this can't go on. The Royal College of Nurses, the doctor who led the Scottish Government's own cancer strategy, Dr Anna Gregor, said the NHS in Scotland is hurtling over a precipice with everyone pretending that it's going to be all right and it won't be, she said. We are warning the Scottish Government over recruitment and retention. Professional bodies are warning the Scottish Government. The medical staff are warning the Scottish Government. They've been coming for years. The question is, when will the SNP listen? Do we want another four years under this SNP Government where targets are missed? Do we want another four years of crippling pressures on existing staff because of vacancies? Can we deal with four more years of inaction from a Government that deludes itself into thinking that they are best placed to run the health service while ignoring the serious concerns of professional bodies and staff. The answer to all those questions is a resounding no, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Cameron. We now move to the open debate. I call Monica Lennon to be followed by James Dornan. Ms Lennon, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm proud to be standing up in the Chamber today to support our hard-working NHS staff and to vote at decision time this evening in favour of a wage rise for the workers who are the foundation of our health service. The continuation of the unfair 1% pay cap on earnings over £22,000 per year means that Scottish nurses will have received on average a pay cut of £3,400 under this SNP government. And the Royal College of Nursing in Scotland tell us that since 2011, nursing staff have experienced a real terms cut in earnings of between 9 and 14 per cent. This situation is frankly unsustainable. Nurses are the foundation of our health service, but they're failing to get the support and resources they need from this SNP government. The facts are clear. Nursing staff are under pressure like never before, finding it more and more difficult to, to get the adequate time to care for their patients, and all the while they're facing their own increasing financial difficulties. The RCN's most recent employment survey, which we've heard about today already, of their members find that 30% have struggled to pay bills, whilst over half have been compelled to work extra and unsocial hours just to make ends meet. Meanwhile, spending on agency and private nurses under the SNP has soared and there's a vacancy crisis with unfilled nursing and midwifery posts. Since 2011, when the SNP formed a majority government, the number of long-term vacancies has rocketed. And Audit Scotland tell us in the same period, agency spend has also rocketed now to a level of £175 million. Perhaps that's an area of savings that the Tories could consider when they're putting questions across to this side of the chamber. Nine out of ten nurses, nine out of ten nurses are telling us that they feel their workload has got worse. And in every aspect, NHS nurses are being overstretched and overworked. An issue I brought to the Chamber recently, Deputy Presiding Officer, in respect of MS nurseries, particularly in NHS Lanarkshire, but right across Scotland. They deserve, like all our staff in the NHS, a much better deal than what they're currently getting from the SNP. Now, in recent years, I've had reason to be in and around hospitals more than I would like. Two years ago this month, my father died in Hearnmeyer's Hospital in East Kilbride after a period of illness. He was only 60 years old and it broke my heart. A couple of days before he died, one of the nurses prepared me and my family for what was ahead. His name was Paul. And although I didn't want to hear what he was telling me, I was so pleased to see him because Paul had cared for my dad and nursed him during a previous admission. He cared for him with such compassion and attentiveness that I hadn't forgotten him and I doubt I ever will. And then there is Katie, another nurse who looked after my dad and my family as we said our goodbyes. 
When I returned to Hair Myers Hospital just two weeks ago, this time waiting for my mum to be taken into surgery, Katie appeared in the waiting room and approached me. It was a lovely surprise to see her, but she gave me one of those hugs that smothers you in kindness when you're struggling to hold it together and leaves you sort of fighting back tears. In between those experiences, last year I had to be referred to the breast clinic at Hair Myers Hospital to have some cancer tests. I went alone and I was terrified and again emotional. The nursing staff were simply first class. They kept me calm as I waited in between different examinations in a very, very busy waiting room. I looked around me at dozens and dozens of people queuing at the desk, people there with children, it was noisy, it was stressful, and I simply wondered, how do these staff manage? So in the, the last year that I've been in the Scottish Parliament, when I come here and I hear Scottish Government ministers and SNP backbenchers accuse me and my Scottish Labour colleagues of rubbishing NHS staff, of talking them down, of playing politics, I feel sick, sick to my stomach. Because when we come here, when our MSPs come here to shine a light on the pressures facing our NHS, it's because we have nothing but admiration and respect for NHS staff. The nurses this parliament will celebrate later on in a member's debate tonight, they're our friends and our neighbours and our loved ones too. So I would ask the Scottish Government, when they come here and deflect criticism of their stewardship of our beloved NHS onto the very staff who have been stretched to breaking point, is that fair? And I know we have a couple of nurses on the SNP benches and I would really ask them to think about where their loyalties lie tonight when they come to press their buttons at five o'clock. How can you have been a nurse and served alongside these people and betray them this evening. I've got a few seconds left, but I'm happy to, Deputy Presiding Officer. Minister. It's maybe slightly different. I just wonder how, as a councillor, could Monica Lennon defend the approach that South Lanarkshire took to the equal pay claims of thousands of women across the authority? Ms Lennon. Well, I'm no longer a councillor, but that is ridiculous coming from a government minister to bring into a debate something that has got no bearing on this. And she knows fine well that I support equal pay for all workers. So I think that is pretty shameful. But let's get back to the point, because at five o'clock, you can smile, but we've heard that nurses, nurses are going to food banks. We had a debate in the parliament last night about food poverty. You can't sit there and say it's someone else's problem and turn away. So tonight we're going to see if we're going to have an SNP, an SNP government voting with a Tory party to block a pay rise for nurses. Yep. I was in my final seconds. Deputy Presiding Officer, thank you for your generosity. The choice is clear tonight. MSPs either support a pay rise for our NHS staff and believe the pay cap should be scrapped or they don't, it's black and white. Labour is clear where we stand, on the side of working people. Others in the chamber should consider doing the same. Thank you. I call James Dornan to be followed by Brian Whittle. Mr Dornan, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, before I start uh, with what I was, I was going to say, can, can I just make it clear to members on that side of the chamber and right across the chamber, they do, do not have a monopoly on people having to deal with the health service. They are not the only people who have had people die in hospital and who care about the nurses and the doctors that treated them. Because what's happened from both, from both those, both those co uh, contributions is suggesting that we don't care about the nurses. We don't care about the hard work that they do and we don't respect the hard work that they do. And of course they do, because like the people on that side of the chamber, every single other person in here will have lost somebody through, uh, in the health service. And I just don't think it's becoming of anybody to try and pretend that they've got a monopoly on that. Now, presiding officer, the NHS is often described as a jewel in the crown of British society and with some justification. Yet, Despite what they say, it seems to me that across the UK, it's the Scottish Government who recognises its importance and prioritises the needs of the NHS, whilst trying to balance the ever-shrinking gift of our own money passed down via the Tory austerity. 
The Scottish Government has consistently protected the frontline health budget at all costs, enabling our health service to be free at the point of need and, importantly, to remain publicly owned. Yes, I will do. Monica Lennon. I thank James Ornan for taking the intervention. Can I ask him what he would ask the Scottish Government to do to stop nurseries in Scotland and our NHS in Scotland having to go to food banks? Scottish nurses, Scottish nurses are better looked after than any other nurses across the UK. And what you fail to recognise at any time in any debate is that we work under the same financial restrictions as the rest of the UK. We make a, a conscious decision to have no compulsory redundancies, to make sure that the lowest paid nurses have got a £400 bonus, to make sure that they, they have got a, a, a wage, a 1% increase that other nurses across the UK don't get. So don't come here and tell us that the Scottish nurses are badly paid in terms, of the, uh, in, in, terms, in terms of the rest of the UK nurses, because in Scotland we are doing everything we can and the restrictions that we have to make sure that Scottish nurses are looked after. <laughs> Across the UK, the NHS is under great pressure, but nowhere more so than in Wales. And un under the devolved Labour administration, accident and emergency waiting times are longer, ambulance response times slower, and patients in Wales wait longer than anywhere in the UK for many routine treatments. Now, maybe Mr Sarwar, who apparently has all the answers when it comes to running a national health service, could use some of his expertise to assist his colleagues in Wales. I could list a load of, a load of figures on how much money the NHS is receiving from the Scottish Government, but I think it's important that we'll look at the result of this investment across Scotland. And again, we, we very often get quotes from certain politicians criticising the new Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And yet in January, there was a peak in the number of women who received maternity care across Glasgow, primarily in the QE. And while numbers were high and patients were looked after at the best available facility, Scottish Labour seemed to see this as another opportunity to use the hospital as a stick to beat the Scottish Government with. The reality is, of course, that the only people they are damaging with their constant carping, outside of their own dwindling political reputation, of course, are the hard-working staff across the Queen Elizabeth and other hospitals. And for you to talk about trying to deflect criticism, we don't try and do that. What happens is the, the politicians that come in here and criticise the health service workers are not us. They're in those benches there. The recent BBC docudrama Scotland Super Hospital has been fascinating and shows just a fraction of the first-class state-of-the-art hospital and what it does for the people of Glasgow. I was a patient in this facility and can vouch for the care they, that, was, that was given there. So, the, and the other thing is that when you're there, parking was free. And why is that important? Because there's families that use the hospitals. I know of one family, two kids, chronically ill, have to use the hospital sometimes four or five times a week. Now, if they had to go there and pay parking charges, along with the stress of having to go to hospital in the first place, they would be in an awful state. It would make things much, much worse. And why is that an issue? Because until the SNP government came in in 2007, this party here made sure that they had to pay for parking in the hospitals. The Labour Party were quite clear that parking in the hospitals was a justifiable price to pay. Of course I will. Neil Finlay. Um, I absolutely agree that the, the removal of parking charges was the right thing to do. What I don't agree with, though, is taking off parking charges and having no traffic management system within the hospitals. Because it's in John's Hospital in Livingston. It is chaos. Parking is chaos with people tending for chemotherapy uh, and other treatments who leave an hour or an hour and a half early to drive around a car park for that hour to try and find somewhere to park. So if we remove the, system, the, the payment system, there has to be a traffic management system. If Aldi's can do it, then surely the NHS can do it. Can I, can I just remind members, interesting though traffic is and traffic it's, parking and charges, the debate is not on that topic, not, neither is the amendment. So can I remind... Mr Dornan, don't talk over me. Don't sit down, please. I'm looking at the amendment, I'm looking at the main debate. Let's keep to that, please, and not drift into another area. Mr Finlay, please sit down. Please sit down. It better be. You want me to speak? I'm letting you say it. I'm Just waiting to see if it's a point of order. Sign officer, um, the issue of parking is relevant because it relates to nurses' pay. They have to pay for parking if they don't use it. That was not in that. Is not in the, it was being extended. It is not relevant to the amendment that's before me nor the motion. I want us to get back to the motion in hand. Both of you, please continue. Can the presiding officer just clarify for me how far away from the, the, the work I have of made the my ruling, Mr Dornan. No, I, I want, want you to get on with your speech. Don't challenge me, please. 
Right, OK. Nurses and midwives are one of the most valuable resources we have, and the Scottish Government also clearly recognises that in order to sustain a high level of care, we must invest in the future of our nursing services. And that's why we are committed to free tuition and bursaries for those studying to be nurses. And not only are we committed to the development of the workforce, but Scotland has worked hard to maintain its no compulsory redundancy policy, while in England there have been over 20,000 redundancies since 2010. And of course, Scotland works under the same financial restrictions as the rest of the UK. Yet I have figures here from the Royal College of Nursing showing that nurses here in Scotland are paid at a higher rate than their counterparts across the UK, which is just another way of showing how we value this service. Now, I know there's an election coming up, and I know that people want to grab headlines with motions criticising the government. However, what I would ask is, in a motion such as this, how do we fund this extra pay? Would they scrap the no compulsory redundancy cap? Would they scrap bursaries for the nurses? Or would the Scottish Labour take away more money from the other vital frontline services which they claim to protect? And where, I may I ask my friends, I was going to say on the left, but in the Conservative Party, where is, where is the £350 million a week for the NHS, which we were promised after Brexit, which this side opposed? Oh, as did most of that side. Well, back then they did, but before they were told that they were no longer opposed to it. It's almost like a cult over there, isn't it? President officer, I had the good fortune to be at the count on Friday to see the SNP take control of Glasgow City Council. There is relevance to this from the Labour Party. So what did I hear there? I heard Anis Sarwar telling a media company that this was a terrible day for the SNP and independence and a strong showing for Labour. So while Mr Sarwar continues to make fanciful and irrelevant contributions, such as he did last Friday and again today, the Scottish Government will keep to the promise of improvement of the NHS and support for our hard-working and much-valued nurses. Thank you very much. I'll have no comments about the length of time from MD. I intervened, you intervened, and I, I have given that time extra to the Speaker because I made a ruling in it. Mr Whittle, followed by Stuart McMillan, please. Mr Whittle. Do I have to? Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I first declare an interest in that my daughter is a healthcare professional uh, in the NHS. And I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and thank Labour for raising uh, this important issue in the Chamber today. Now, I'm sure across this Chamber uh, there will be complete agreement that our NHS staff, like all our frontline public servants, like the police and fire service and so on, deserve to be paid appropriately for the work they do and the care and attention they give on a daily basis. The question remains, of course, is how this is achieved in a sustainable and consistent manner beyond the political rhetoric uh, and posturing. In the last week, I've had the opportunity to witness firsthand health care on the front line. Firstly, I spent some time in A&E, and you'll be pleased to hear that I was seen well within the four-hour guideline. While waiting to see, be seen by the duty nurse, I was able to, approach, uh, to watch the nurses' station and observe what was actually going on. Harassed staff phoning through to the front desk, asking them to stop sending people through because there was no room. Patients complaining that they had already been sitting for half an hour, and a nurse saying that she was fed up leaving the hospital, feeling guilty, even though she was, she was well over her hours at eight o'clock in the evening, and she was due back and in the morning shift. I did take the opportunity to speak with her, and what she wanted above all was to feel valued. For us to understand the role she did, to have the staff numbers and experience to cope with that demand, to have the flexibility and duty roster to cope with the fluctuating demand. On Monday night, I met with a GP who was part of a practice that had taken the difficult decision to close a surgery in Fenwick and resigned the rest of the practice in Cross House in Kilmores. NHS uh, Ayrshire and Aaron are currently looking for GPs to take over the practice and have only, only had one tentative inquiry since January this year. Five GPs potentially taken out of a system in Kilmarnock, compounded by the fact that within 18 months, a further six GPs are due for retirement in the same area. A potential loss of 11 GPs. Oh, can I just finish this point? Thank you. A potential loss of 11 GPs in Kilmarnock. As of two weeks ago, there were already 15 GPs advertised positions unfilled in Ayrshire. And a recent pre presentation in primary care at Glasgow University makes it obvious that this is far from being an isolated problem. It's endemic across Scotland. Marie Todd. Thank you. Presiding officer, would the member agree with me that whilst there are difficulties in recruitment to, be G to general practice, 
the report today by the Royal College of General Practitioners about the impact of Brexit on the workforce in Scotland is particularly worrisome. And I would say to Donald Cameron, your colleague, particularly worrisome for those of us who represent rural areas like the Highlands and Islands, where up to one in four of the doctors is an EU national. Mr Whittle, I'll give, I'll give you your time back. That was a long intervention. Thank you. You see, the, the problem is, see, it's not just about recruiting staff from across the world. What about supporting our own and retaining our own homegrown GPs? So here's the thing. That GP told me that uh, she wrote to Shona Robson two weeks before resigning the practice on 31st of January asking for help, and they are still awaiting a reply. No, I won't take an intervention, thank you. They are still awaiting reply. It's all, about, it's all very well having the rhetoric, but it's action that actually, uh, actually applies here, and it's patently not the case with this government. When that GP joined the practice as a partner 10 years ago, it was the eighth one that she applied to. Now a GP can pretty much choose whatever practice they want to go to. And I was shocked to be told that the most dramatic change had happened in only the last three years. As, as has been alluded to, uh, the practices that suffer the most are the rural practices as GPs migrate towards population centres. The people that suffer the most are the patients who lose continuity of care, because it's not just GPs that we're losing. It's the years of experience in those communities and the relationships of trust that's been built up with patients over the years, over the years of treatment. Locums are being increasingly sought to fill gaps, and here's a major financial issue which must be addressed. Three years, three years ago, they were paying a locum around £180 a day. Now I'm told the practice which has just closed was having to pay £250 for a locum to cover just four hours. With the pressure that our GPs are under, coupled with the demand, is it no wonder that they're working as a locum is such an attractive proposition? The issue, according to this GP and her colleagues, is not the money that they earn, it is being valued. It's recognising that GPs are the gatekeepers, the healthcare professionals with long-term patient relationships built on years of working in a community. The plea from GPs is firstly to stabilise the current workforce as an immediate priority. The consequence of not addressing this right now, according to this GP, is more people ending up in hospital. The consequence is that the next conversation we will have will be how we deal with the mess and the fallout. It is true for politicians as it is for GPs. The longer you leave the problem before treating it, the harder it is to deal with. The reality is that as GP numbers have fallen, hospital consultant numbers have risen. With falling frontline GP numbers, the number of patients ending up in hospital inevitably rises coming through a &E, patients that could and should be dealt with in the local GP practices. And this brings me to the Labour motion. It's not just about the levels of pay. An NHS which is sustainable for the long term must be the aim that, quite frankly, will take a radical overhaul of the way in which we view health and healthcare. It requires a culture change in how health professionals are viewed and treated both by this place and by the public more widely. The preventable health agenda, where there are potentially billions to recoup and reinvest, has to be placed front and centre instead of the lip service that it currently, is currently given. The job that healthcare professionals do must be made to be more attractive and a valued career path. And, the words, and in the words of healthcare professionals, that's more about just money. Choosing a career as a healthcare professional is not driven by financial reward. It is driven by a desire to care. What came across loud and clear in my recent conversations with healthcare professionals, way above all else, is concern for patients and what will happen to them if the NHS is not steered onto a more sustainable course, where the baseline is to improve long-term health outcomes through sustained continuity of care. If we are serious about recruiting into the health service to address demand, if we are serious about rewarding our healthcare professionals appropriately, simply throwing more money at the problem isn't the right course of action. We need to stop treating the symptoms of the systemic issues in the NHS and focus on dealing with them long term. Let's stop trying to just keep the show on the road and start thinking about how we build a sustainable future for our NHS. Thank you. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Alison Johnson. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Uh, presiding officer, uh, we've already heard today uh, uh, comments uh, regarding the Royal College of Nursing uh, uh, for Scotland briefing and it's something from uh, some of the folk from the, the Labour benches and I'd like to just comment uh, or quote as well from the, their particular briefing. The Royal College of Nursing in Scotland state that pay awards for NHS staff have been constrained by the UK government's policy on public sector pay since 2011. It should however be noted 
that the Scottish Government has implemented recommendations made by the PRB to date, even when the UK Government has not. This means that whilst terms and conditions remain broadly equivalent across all countries, pay rates for each of the band, uh, pay, sorry, pay rates for each of the band, for each of the pay bands vary. And so that means certainly in Scotland uh, that there has been an increase and there is a higher level of pay across the bands in Scotland. I also want to touch upon a couple of points as well, and that's, uh, I, I've just started, I'll, I'll let you, I'll try and let you in later. Uh, Westminster, the Westminster Government has reduced Scotland's fiscal Dell budget by 9.2% in real terms between 2010-11 and up to 2019-20. In spite of this, the Scottish Government have committed to continue to provide above inflation increases in Scotland's health budget. And also whilst in government, the SNP government has protected the frontline health budget, increasing it by 40% from 2006-07 to 2017-18. And also health funding now stands at record levels in 2017-18. Health spending in Scotland will exceed £13 billion, with resource spending being over £3.6 billion more than when this government took office in 2007. And also, presiding officer, uh, it, Her Majesty's Treasury figures in the state that health spending per head in Scotland is 7.2% higher than in England. That's an equivalent of £152 per person. Uh, so in terms of the NHS uh, in Scotland, uh, it's clear that these figures highlight that although there are challenges in the NHS, and I don't think anybody on these benches uh, could, uh, could indicate that there aren't any challenges in the NHS. There will always be challenges in the NHS, irrespective as to which party or parties are actually in power. That's going to be the case here. It will also be the case in England and also in Wales. And we've already heard some examples of that in this debate this afternoon. But nonetheless, presiding officer, it's clear that in terms of the finance and the importance that this Scottish Government actually places upon the NHS in Scotland, it's, it's, the, it's absolutely paramount. And but with the funding that is going into the NHS, and with the, the level uh, of, of focus that's going in to actually make our NHS better and more responsive, then it's, uh, I think uh, members from across the chamber have really got to, to try to understand that particular level in terms of the funding that's also going in. Now, our NHS staff are resilient, and we've heard that already today and also in previous debates. Our NHS staff are resilient, and they do have a unique set of skills which they bring uh, to their patients and also to the multidisciplinary teams in which they operate. And also our NHS staff are always there at times of crisis to treat, care and reassure their parents uh, now, and also their patients. Now, I, I have been very fortunate that I've not actually had to call upon NHS staff very often. And I'm quite fortunate as well that it's within my family. It's been, we've been very fortunate from that perspective too. But certainly with constituents I deal with on a regular basis, that there have been challenges there. And, uh, and but the one thing that comes back time and time again is uh, how valued uh, our NHS staff actually are. And I, for one, and I'm sure every single member of this chamber fully recognises and appreciates every single thing that our NHS staff actually do uh, for the country. Uh, the Scottish Government's public sector pay policy it sets out the 1% maximum increase for those earning over £22,000 per annum and the continued real-term reductions in public sector budgets uh, in Scot for Scotland the 2017-18 that flow from the UK government spending round. And members of the Tories actually have to recognise that. It's their cuts are coming to this parliament. Their cuts are coming to this government. Uh, and that means that the constraints and pay bills across all public sector organisations is still required. However, it's also recognised that maintaining employment and fair rates of pay in the public sector is crucial in ensuring that Scotland's economy remains strong. And the aim of the policy is to allow public bodies to provide a pay increase for all staff, with particular support for those in the lowest incomes, and for employers to take their own decisions about pay progression. Now, there is a context between NHS England and also NHS Scotland, and the proposal, the proposal to increase the pay of NHS staff uh, beyond 1% annum is born primarily out of the fact that there are severe staff shortages of NHS staff, particularly nurses in England. Now, speaking of the BBC a Radio Force Today programme, Jonathan Ashworth, the Shadow Health Secretary, revealed that as a result of the staff shortages in England, Labour would scrap the 1% pay cap in place for all NHS staff. It would reverse the end, uh, sort of reverse uh, the end to bursaries and introduction of tuition fees planned for August for student nurses and midwives. And indeed, the latest UCAS uh, figures have revealed the deep damage that Tory government cuts are having on the nursing sector in England, with applications to English nursing courses down 23% this year after the UK government abolished bursaries 
that encourage people to take up training. It's certainly no wonder. That actually highlights the fact that Donald Cameron earlier on today didn't want to talk about the comparisons to England with a 23% reduction in applicants, tuition freeze and bursaries scrapped uh, and also uh, the issue of and also with the issue of the creeping privatisation of the NHS in England. Now, I'm conscious of time, setting officer, so I am going to conclude to just with, with this point. The SNP government continues to value the work of the independent NHS peer review body, and the Scottish government again applied the recommendations this year. And the Scottish government has been consistent in its efforts to offer the right support to nursing students, keeping free tuition and protecting the bursary and creating the discretionary hardship fund, supporting our NHS staff of the future as well as today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr McMillan. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Alec Cole-Hamilton. Ms Johnson, please. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is time for the pay cap to be scrapped. Years of pay restraint have eroded living standards for our NHS staff. We can't deny the negative impact this has on staff morale or the effect it has on staff retention. The NHS in Scotland already faces severe workforce shortages with a retirement boom on the horizon and many staff are looking back at years and years of real terms pay cuts and wondering whether they can afford to keep on giving to the NHS. I will support this motion today because the Scottish Greens believe we must restore the value of pay for our NHS staff and indeed in our wider public sector. The pay cap has a direct impact on our wider communities. The NHS employs over 160,000 people in Scotland, the majority women, and a below inflation pay cap contributes to the gender pay gap and inhibits multiplier effects in our local communities and economies. Hospitals and health centres are vital anchors in these communities and holding down pay has implications for them, particularly in our remote and rural regions. Now, the Scottish Government's position is that they adhere to the NHS independent pay review body's recommendations passing on those pay uplifts in full. I am glad this often results in better pay for NHS workers in Scotland compared to their counterparts in England. Ensuring a minimum increase of £500 for staff earning 22000 or less is a positive measure, but I don't believe it goes far enough. The independent pay reviews body last report is quite clear that government sector pay policies set the context for its recommendations. On NHS pay in England, it says, we were told by the health departments that a 1% pay award is funded and it is clear that a pay award higher than 1% would require trade-offs in terms of service levels, investment decisions and potentially staff numbers with associated implications for workload and pressures on staff and service delivery. Now, if the independent pay review body is only prepared to make recommendations that are already in line with the government's spending plans and sets the expectations the NHS staff should bear the cost of trade-offs between pay and service delivery, then I struggle to see where the independence lies. The report also outlines the Department of Health's view that public sector pay restraint pay played a key role in the government's intention to reduce the budget deficit. It seems clear to me that the report makes its recommendations in that fiscal context. And I say that it is not for nurses, midwives and healthcare assistants to play a key role in reducing the budget deficit. And the NHS pay should not be based on misguided economic austerity. But even the NHS pay reviews body report acknowledges that in 2017, inflation is outpacing forecasts and we are approaching the point where current pay policies will require change. Public sector workers did not cause a financial crisis and they should not be expected to shoulder that burden 10 years on or observe the financial pressures on our NHS due to demographic change. In view of the UK-wide pay review body's overall approach, I'd be inclined to support a Scottish system for pay review in future. But if professional bodies and trade unions take a strong view that pay recommendations should still be set on a UK-wide basis, then it is vital that the Scottish Government plays a full part in that process. The pay review body's report was blunt about the impact that postponing the draft budget had on the process, delaying submission of evidence from the Scottish Government, reducing time available for scrutiny, and inhibiting the ability of other parties to respond to the Government's position. The Royal College of Nursing have told us that the pay cap has resulted in a 9 to 14% drop in earnings for, nurse, for nursing staff since 2011. I believe this grossly undervalues the care nurses give, the long hours they work, and the pressure that they face. 
The Royal College of Nursing's recent survey of members found, as we've heard, that 30% had struggled to pay gas and electricity bills and, staggeringly, 14% had missed meals because of financial difficulties. Yes, certainly. Marie Todd. Thank you. I wonder if you or anyone in this chamber can provide me with information about how many of the respondents to that survey were based in Scotland. Alison Johnson. I was speaking to nurses yesterday and I can tell you, I can confirm that this policy is having an impact on them. Yesterday I spoke to an experienced nurse who has taken on a part-time job because she simply cannot make ends meet. And while I've heard that pay progression is still in place and that is to be welcome, the fact of the matter is now someone doing a job could be paid less than someone was being paid for that same job in 2011. We have a problem here. Nurses shouldn't have to cope with financial pressure at home as well as pressure at work. The Royal College of Nursing is calling for a pay award of 2.6% in line with the retail price index and I believe this is right and fair. Economic inequalities are at the centre of health inequalities in this country. That can't be denied. And you don't have to be living in absolute poverty to suffer poor mental health because of debt, to suffer stress because you've no work-life balance, because you keep taking on extra shifts to keep your head above water. These financial factors have an incremental effect leading to sickness and time off work. Staff absence in turn pushes up spending on agency staff and NHS employees really feel that unfairness when they see how much is being spent on agency nurses and locum doctors. Or they could look to Denmark where hospital nurses are paid around 16% more than here in the UK or Australia where their pay would be over 20% better and we know sadly that many of them are. Now, our nurses don't go into this profession for the money, nor do our midwives, paramedics, our public health professionals, our physiotherapists, our psychologists. But they shouldn't expect their dedication, professionalism and expertise to go unrewarded as their pay falls below inflation. Now, the government's amendment says they will jointly commission work to develop an evidence base to assess the impact of pay restraint. I think we have a good idea what the impact of pay restraint is. I think our NHS staff know the impact and they've already made clear in previous submissions to the pay review body what this impact is. The Royal College of Nursing have polled their members on the action that should be taken on pay restraint, including the option to ballot for industrial action. That is how urgent the situation is. Can the Presiding member wind officer, up, please? I believe that restoring the value of NHS pay will have a positive impact on staff retention and professional development, and ultimately on the standard of care we all want to receive. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Alec Cole-Hamilton to call by Richard Leonard. Mr Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate the Labour Party in bringing forward this important debate and I ensure them of the uh, support of these benches tonight. I have spent this first year in my term as MSP for Edinburgh Weston on one of the steepest learning curves of my life. It has been my great privilege to serve as my party's health spokesperson throughout that time and I have met through my introduction to the many tiers and avenues of, of our health service some of the finest, most dedicated professionals in our society. People who in many cases and from an early age have answered an inner calling to meet the needs of the most vulnerable and infirm in our society. And they have done so without thought of reward. Just as well, because there are very few roles within the health service which attract opulent financial recompense. Pay in the NHS has never been world beating, but the cap that we debate today has seen a year on year real terms de decline in take home pay for hard working staff across our health service. Now, in the teeth of a hard Brexit and with the devaluation of the pound that comes with that, we see the value of those pay packets diminish still further and with it, the buying power of hundreds of thousands of employees. We ask so much of those who we look to for treatment and for care, and yet we offer so little by way of reward, and that which we do offer is diminishing by degrees. Presiding officer, I don't think it's melodramatic to say that to continue on as we have done so, with no prospect of pay increase uh, in real terms for our NHS or social care workers, represents an existential threat to the delivery of both health and social care in our society. Because at its bedrock, the NHS and the social care system that underpins it is nothing without its staff. The rhythms of our health service are constantly interrupted by the stuttering of staff shortages, inadequate workforce planning and an attrition in our staff base. And underpinning all of this is the need for fair and equitable pay to make a career in health or social care an attractive and viable life path choice once again. 
We cannot expect that pressures on our hospitals or GP surgeries to abate while they are so hungry for a new staff cohort that in many cases is either just not coming up through the ranks or who instead is looking overseas for opportunities which attract greater financial incentive. Adequate investment in our workforce is simply vital. It is the call that we, all of us in this chamber, receive from stakeholders in every speciality in the sector and in the Labour Party motion tonight. At all too many junctures in the system, the system is buckling under the weight of demand. Evidence in the revelations from Audit Scotland last September that our health boards have missed all but one of the national targets that they are expected to meet. Delays in accident and emergency often offer the starkest such insight to the chronic problem we place, face in throughput within our health system. I was very grateful to meet with representatives from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, who opened my eyes to the reality underpinning those massive delays beyond the four-hour target. A&E waiting times act as a weather vane for the natural state of flow in the health service. They don't point, as people often expect, to a problem in capacity in A&E, but instead the reality of how easy it is to clear patients out of A&E into the wider hospital. Put simply, these delays are caused by bed blocking, which is in turn is caused by a profound shortage in social care capacity. I have raised many times the case of George Ballantyne, my elderly constituent who had to endure 150 nights in Liberton Hospital. I will, in a second, be on the point at which he was declared fit to go home. I'll take an intervention from Marie Todd. I'm sorry, I, I perhaps missed the congratulations from um, my colleague Alec Cole Hamilton to the Scottish Government about their incredible performance on A&E four-hour waiting times over the last number of years compared to all of the other UK countries, given that it is indeed a Canadian the mine target Alec Cole for the health of the system. Well, I am delighted to congratulate Marie Todd in neither using the word coalition or conservatives in her intervention to me this, this time. But on this point, I think that you are missing the trick entirely. The point about A&E targets is the fact that we have a colossal uh, problem of bed blocking in our hospitals. And the delay in this discharge was due entirely to the fact the social care package for Mr. Ballantyne, of which I was speaking earlier, um, was that that was not available. No nighttime check could be established into a programme because there was no staff available to do it. That delay cost NHS Scotland hundreds of thousands of pounds. So when those members uh, on the government benches asked me from where we get the money to pay for such an uplift, I point them to Mr Ballantyne and his protracted stay in the most expensive hotel in Edinburgh. The cost of failure demand in Mr Ballantyne's case is replicated across every health board in our country. And as such, if we were only to recalibrate the direction of expenditure, we could free up far more resource to offer financial recompense at every level. It is precisely because we fail to invest in our social care workforce that cases like this are so commonly raised within the proceedings of this chamber. We expect carers to attend their charges for sometimes as little as 15 minutes a session because of travel times and to receive a salary that they could just as well find stacking shelves in a local supermarket. Local authorities state with regularity that they commission social care on grounds of quality over cost, yet the reality of that split is felt most keenly by service users on the ground. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is often easy for members of the opposition to ask the moon of government to write cheques that were we in government, we could never hope to cash ourselves. But on this, the solution to so much of the staff crisis that bedevils our health service and much of our social care service is blindingly simple. And I'll finish here. Entice people back to the fold. Invest in our workforce. Give them a future of comfort and security and they will visit it back on the people in their care tenfold. We have so much to be proud of in the men and women who deliver care in this country. The very least that we can do as public servants ourselves is to ensure that they can do the job they love with a measure of dignity and the proper reward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Cole Hampton. Before I call you, Mr Leonard, could I ask Neil Finlay, Marie Todd and Emma Harper to press the request to speak buttons? Now, there's a, a technical glitch in here that if you intervene, your request to speak button goes off. Sorry, Mr Leonard. Thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I refer, refer members uh, to my register of interests, uh, specifically my membership of the GMB and Unite Trade Unions? Uh, with this motion today, Labour is showing people a way out of a failing economy in which working people are being made to pay the price for a crisis they did not create. Wages, which were once rising gradually, are not increasing anymore. Housing costs, even the price of food, 
cannot be afforded any longer. And for too many people, fuel poverty is not going down, it is going up. We have the poor, the working poor, and the public service working poor as well. People whose wages have been held down year after year. Nurses experiencing a real terms pay cut of 13% since 2010. And other people working in full-time jobs in our National Health Service still below the poverty line, still forced to claim benefits, and all done in our name. It's not as though we are living beyond our means. It's rather we are not equitably distributing our means. All the demands for sacrifice are aimed at working people delivering our public services, whilst the idle rich are studiously ignored, with the result that in Scotland, the richest 1% own more personal wealth than the whole of the poorest 50% put together. And it has other consequences too. As Cheryl Gedling of the PCS Union told the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee of this Parliament uh, on the 18th of April, and I quote, as long as we continue to have pay freezes and pay restraint, we will not eradicate the gender pay gap. In days gone by, incomes policy was part of a wider programme of action by government through a social contract to deliver a social wage, including food price subsidies and rent subsidies, increases to the basic state pension, investment in our industrial base, investment in our public services. But what we have today is not a two-way social contract, it's a blunt one-way fiat of austerity. In their amendment, the SNP government make comparisons with England. Well, I'm sure it will be a comfort to the midwives working around the clock in Wishaw, to the nurses in the Fourth Valley Royal Hospital in Larbert at the top, at the top of their pay band, to the porters toiling... Yes, I'll give way. Cabinet Secretary. Well, would you make the same speech to a Labour Party conference in Wales where nurses are paid less than in Scotland? Richard Leonard. Um, the last time I checked, I was in the Scottish Parliament addressing an SNP government. And what will you say? What will you say, Cabinet Secretary, to the porters, to the porters toiling long hours, working long weekends at, at Hare Myers Hospital, to the ambulance crews on call, stationed right across the country, to the hard-working cleaners in the Monklands Hospital on £8.50 an hour, the lowest paid? I'm sure it will be a comfort to them that if they were living in England, they would be even worse off, subject to even more restraint. And I'm sure, in light of their experience, they will greet with some cynicism too the suggestion in the Cabinet Secretary's amendment that the best resolution will be found in partnership working and the benevolence of the Scottish Government. When the NHS peer review body produced its recommendation, it said this, the scale of efficiency savings that the NHS is required to make appear to be bigger bigger in Scotland than other parts of the UK, with the Scottish Government telling us that health boards will be expected to make 3% efficiencies in 2017 to 18. So I'm challenging the Government today to support this motion to scrap the cap and allow for free and responsible collective bargaining. And let me turn to the conserv and let me turn to the Conservative no, I've given way already. Let me turn to the Conservative Amendment too, because we have a Trade Union Act on the statute book, which is barely a year old. It's a Tory Act, which I presume the Tory members here support. It's an act which singles out public service workers and puts at the very top of that list of public service workers, workers in health services, the very workers we are discussing this afternoon. That's what, what's on the face of the act which they support. The act demands minimum turnout thresholds of 50%. Minimum majority thresholds of 40% in order for industrial action to be taken legally by health service workers. And I'm bound to say that if these same rules were applied to the local government elections last week, which Tory MSPs and ministers now apply to NHS workers, not a single Tory councillor would have been elected anywhere in Scotland. And of the course member the is Tories in his last minute. want to stop trade unions having a political voice too. I want to remind the Parliament, finally, of the principles of the health service set out by Anaya and Bevan. Bevan said, society becomes more wholesome, more serene and spiritually healthier if it knows that its citizens have at the back of their consciousness the knowledge that not only themselves, 
but all their fellows have access when ill to the best that medical skills can provide. If the job is to be done, the state must accept financial responsibility. These prophetic words of Nye Bevan are chosen carefully. They remind us that the foundation stone of the NHS is not medical machinery or pharmaceutical formulas, but the skills and dedication of the people who work in the National Health Service. And to the SNP, let me finish by saying this. It's no good complaining, to, it's no good claiming to be on the side of the workers in the NHS when you are not prepared to back them up. It's no good claiming to be investing in the NHS if you are not investing in the people who deliver the NHS. So I would urge all members to look to their conscience, to accept financial responsibility and accept moral responsibility as well and back the Labour motion this afternoon. Thank you. And before I call the uh, next member, I'm going to say to anyone on the front benches, if you're going to intervene, intervene properly, don't heckle from the side. Ivan McKee, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, today's debate gives us an opportunity to highlight the different approaches to nurses pay adopted across each part of the UK. And I welcome the Labour Party bringing this debate to the Parliament this week in advance of International Nurses Day, which falls this weekend. The debate gives us a chance to compare and contrast how the different administrations, the Scottish Government, the UK Government and the Welsh Government, each treat the most valuable asset of our NHS, its staff. Because while well, there's a clear process in place to determine nurses' pay with independent peer review body making recommendations each year that cover all parts of the UK, the approach of each government has differed. And this tells us much about what we need to know about the priorities, focus and commitment of each administration and of the parties that run them. While well, both the Tory-led UK government and the Labour-run Welsh government have failed to implement in full the recommendations of the peer review body. The Scottish Government, run by the SNP, in contrast, has stood by the body's recommendations and implemented them in full. So while Labour talks a talk, while failing to meet the PBRB's recommendations, but has the power to do so, and the Tories look the other way, it is the SNP which has met its obligations to abide by the agreements that are in place, funding nurses pay to the level required by the review body. The Royal College of Nursing understands this well, as it said in its briefing in advance of the debate today. It states, the Scottish Government has implemented recommendations made by the PRB to date, even when the UK Government has not. This means pay rates for each of the pay bands vary. For example, the starting salary for a newly qualified nurse is £21,909 in England, the same in Wales. 21,693 in Northern Ireland and 22,218 in Scotland. A band five nurse in Scotland earns £300 more than their equivalents in England and in Wales. It is a clear demonstration of their priorities that the Tories never stop talking about the top 10%, the higher rate taxpayers who can afford to pay a bit more, while they never mention NHS staff who benefit from a similar amount in higher pay in Scotland, never mind the benefit of the council tax, some £400 lower in Scotland, in the rest of the UK implementing the majority of households. Because when it comes right down to it, the Tories' priorities, their target constituency is laid bare for all to see. If you're in the top 10%, they will argue tooth and nail for your interests. If you happen to be an NHS worker in a fraction of that, then they're not interested in even honouring the independent recommendations on your pay. And not only are the SNP and government honouring the PRB's recommendations, additional measures have also been put in place to assist lower paid in the profession. A flat rate £400 uplift for those earning £22,000 or less has been implemented, recognising the particular pressures on low paid staff. The Scottish Government also understands the importance of, support, importance of supporting those entering the profession, ensuring nurses are trained for the future to support our growing health service. Nursing bursaries are still in place in Scotland and nursing students pay no tuition fees. This is in stark contrast to policies elsewhere in the UK where both have been scrapped. As a consequence, the number of English applicants to nursing courses has plummeted by 23%, 10 times worse than in Scotland. It is no surprise that England is suffering from a 9% nurse vacancy rate, more than double that in Scotland, a consequence of the different approaches to the treatment of staff. And the Scottish Government also understands the need to provide stability and security for our NHS staff. In contrast to the situation south of the border, 
where there have been more than 20,000 compulsory redundancies over the past six years. NHS Scotland has continued with its policy of no compulsory redundancies. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government's higher remuneration practices also apply to other NHS workers. Entry-level support staff in Scotland are paid £1,128 more per year than their English counterparts. Consultant salaries in Scotland can be up to £2,000 higher than elsewhere in the UK. These measures are underpinned by the Scottish Government's commitment to support our health service, with £500 million of real terms funding increases over the lifetime of this Parliament, £500 million more than that committed by Scottish Labour in their 2016. Sure. Anna Sarwar. The member for taking intervention. Will he agree that for any nurse or any NHS staff member in Scotland to have to turn to a food bank is a scandal and unacceptable? And what action does he suggest should be taken if not giving them a pay rise? Ivan Key. If the member had been listening for the last five minutes, you would have understood what I've just said. In Scotland, nurses are getting paid more than they are in Labour run Wales. And what's he got to say about that? And the point I was just making the Scottish Government has committed £500 million more to the health service than Scottish Labour had in their 2016 manifesto that they were elected on last year. This against the backdrop of a 10 years real term 9.2% Dell funding reduction from the UK Government to Scotland since 2010 when the Tories came to office and not only in funding and support for its staff that NHS Scotland is outperforming its counterparts in England and in Labour run Wales, any performance significantly higher in Scotland than across the yes rest of the UK. And the Scottish Government has also stood firm against the creeping privatisation of services in the rest of the UK, a trend that has seen 7% of health service provision down south now in private hands. In conclusion, presiding officer, the contrast between how the SNP Scottish Government funds and runs the health service here and how the Tory UK Government and the Labour-run Welsh Government run their health services could not be clearer. When it comes to fulfilling our commitment to implement the recommendation on nurses' pay, as in so many other aspects of running our NHS, it is this SNP Government that the people of Scotland can trust to have their interests at heart and to deliver for staff and patients alike. Uh, can, can I say to members, we have no time at all in hand, so really strict guidelines, please. Maurice Corey to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, I thank Anna Sawa for bringing forward this important debate. This has been an extremely interesting debate so far on a very significant matter, so I'm delighted to contribute to it. I join others in paying tribute to those who work in the NHS and care for us on a daily basis. And I'd also like to focus on securing the long-term future of the NHS in Scotland and how staff should be supported by improving the short-term uh, short, uh, um, staffing crisis. In the 10 years that the SNP have been in power in Scotland, the NHS has taken a turn for the worse uh, with a major staffing crisis. The Scottish Government has, given a, has taken a short-term view on job vacancies within the NHS, much to the detriment of our NHS in Scotland. We no longer have the numbers of staff that we need to ensure that patients get the best treatment possible. The number of nursing vacancies, for example, have been on the rise. On the 31st December 2016, there was a vacancy rate of 4.1% within the nursing and midwifery posts, which has risen from 3.6% in 2015. These vacancies are putting increasing levels on pressure on overstretched staff, let me continue, uh, to con deliver higher quality services. Similarly, uh, GPs, consultants and mental health specialists have all seen a rise in the number of vacancies. Every empty post puts further strain on an already exhausted staff. And like with nurses, this puts down and puts an undue stress on those working in our health services as the Scottish Government looks to solve this problem by sourcing locum doctors and nurses. The Scottish Government continues to look for temporary solutions rather than seeing the bigger picture which is at the expense of the Scottish people. In fact, due to this pure, poor workforce planning, the use of agency nurses has increased by almost 50% in one year. This has inevitably led to a rise in the cost of agency staff and increasing by six times in three years. In addition, that the Scottish Government are spending nearly a quarter of a billion pounds in locum staff. This is completely unsustainable and is nothing to do to, will do nothing to solve the long-term issue of vacancies in the NHS. Whilst I, can, while I recognise that there will always be a need for locum staff, we certainly should not be reliant on this form of staffing as we are at present. What we're seeing is, in fact, a sticking plaster approach by this government. Now former MSP, Dr. Jean Turner, Chief Executive of the Scottish Patients Association, 
called for fewer locums and bank staff to be used and more NHS staff to be appointed. She stated in 2015, our health service is in a serious state, really serious, and if we want to care when we're old, have care when we're old, we have to look after it today. Furthermore, the Royal College of Nursing Associate Director Ellen Hudson highlighted that we need to find new ways for health boards to focus on long-term sustainability of services. From this, we can only tackle this serious issue by filling vacant posts on a permanent basis. And furthermore, gaps within the NHS in Scotland are only predicted to grow with many staff close to retirement age. This is particularly prominent amongst nurses and midwives, of which one-fifth are set to retire over the next decade. This means that 18.2% of the workforce are planning to retire within the next 10 years, which will have a significant impact on NHS staffing across Scotland and put even more strain on an overburdened staff. The Scottish Government needs to focus more on recruitment to ensure that we have a sustainable NHS workforce in Scotland for the future, and the Scottish Government are currently ret returning to retired GPs to fill staffing gaps. There have been also many cases of trusts and health boards in Scotland having to recruit from abroad due to the shortage of qualified staff. And this is not the way to secure the future of our NHS in Scotland. Yep. And in fact, it looks like we're starting to see the impact of Nicola Sturgeon's cuts from when she was Health Secretary. Uh, between 2009 and 2012, the number of training places for nurses and midwives were slashed by more than a fifth, over, and over 2,000 nursing jo uh, jobs were cut to help balance the books. The Royal College of Nursing believes that those cuts are now hitting the NHS in Scotland as students from these years are graduating and taking up full-time jobs. The Royal College of Nursing have summarised the situation as follows. We warned that this was short-sighted short and would lead to problems. We have increased demand for services and not enough nursing staff, with staff bearing the brunt of these pressures and health boards having to employ expensive agency staff to fill the gaps. So therefore, in conclusion, the SNP government, sorry, must in the last minute, the SNP government were warned about their actions at this time and now need to take responsibility for ultimately bringing these staffing shortages today. We now ask that they start planning the NHS workforce for the future and ensuring that we take measures to improve the sustainability of our NHS here in Scotland. I will be supporting the Conservative Amendment. Thank you. Well done, Maurice. I have Neil Finlay to be followed by Marie Todd. Uh, thanks, President Officer, uh, and can I thank and ask Sarwar for bringing this motion uh, and for uh, getting the government to act, because clearly they're acting now and would never have acted unless this motion had come forward. I have to declare an interest in this debate, as both my wife and daughter work in the NHS, both of them very much at the lower end of the NHS pay scale, and I also have to declare an interest as a member of Unite the Union. Uh, my wife's and daughter's colleagues across the NHS, the porters, the clerks, the domestics, kitchen staff, tradesmen and women, as well as clinical support workers, nurses, physios, OTs and the rest have been subjected to years of austerity pay where their salaries have been frozen or capped at no more than 1%. Years of pay settlements below the rate of inflation. Well, at the same time, the cost of basic food items like beef and fish and dairy products, the cost of transport, the cost of gas and electricity have all soared well over 20% in the retail price index is forecast for inflation to reach 3%. This has resulted in an effective pay cut of around £3,500 for a band five nurse, as people have already said. The reality of working in Scotland's NHS is that we have a system under pressure like never before. Staff are run ragged, morale is low, vacancies are up, and the system is creaking at the seams. And all of this overwhelmingly and disproportionately impacts on women workers who make up three quarters of our NHS staff. So much for addressing gender pay issues. The Scottish Government will claim staff spending has increased by over 7%. This may be uh, between 2012, 2011 sorry, and 2016. This may be true, but of course it's been driven by an increased spend on bank, agency and overtime payments to try and plug that staffing gap. Indeed, agency spend has doubled over that period. And we see staff working more hours via the staff bank and, agency, uh, and via agencies to try and make up for lost pay. Okay. Aileen Campbell. I just wonder if the member has taken that same message to Wales, where they spend considerably much more on bank and agency staff than we do in Scotland. Neil Finlay. There's more chance of me telling my Welsh colleagues that some home truths than there is of your 
uh, members telling you some home truths because you have to sign a statement to say you can't do it. So that may be true, but it's driven by an increase in bank spending, agency spending and overtime payments to plug the gap. And we see staff working more hours uh, uh, via bank and agencies. Audit Scotland tell us agency staff cost more and pose a greater risk to patient safety and quality of care. On which planet is it sensible to be paying 84,000 a year to nursing agencies for one nurse for one year? But that's the reality of what is happening. Now, of course, all of this impacts on vacancy rates. Rates for nursing and midwifery staff, 3.6%. 9% health visitors, visitors, 5% public health nurses, almost 5% for GPs, 6.5% for consultant. Similar vacancy rates across the NHS. And for tradesmen in the States, workers, it's difficult to recruit, for example, electricians and other craftsmen because pay has not kept up with industry rates. President officer, NHS staff do not want to be patronised. They're heartily sick of the warm words about them being angels and heroes. What they want is respect. They want a supportive management regime uh, within the establishment they work. They want an employer who cares about their well-being and the tools they go on with the job they enjoy. And crucially, they want the pay that recognises all of that. Unison in their UK-wide, yes, UK-wide staff survey identified two-thirds of staff feeling worse off in the previous 12 months. 34% relying on overtime payments to pay their bills, half relying on financial support from family and friends, and 11% using a payday lender. What a state of affairs for our greatest public services. What a, what a state of affairs for the staff who deliver the care we need when we are sick and injured. And let's be clear, this is a major contributory factor in people choosing other careers. I want people to join the NHS. I'm proud that my daughter, who works as a weekend hospital cleaner in St John's, will soon graduate as, a, uh, as an occupational therapist and hopefully secure a job in the NHS. But increasing stress, high vacancies, and unhealthy management culture, combined with a decline in pay, is not a recipe for addressing the shortages and demands on the system. The Cabinet Secretary can and must act, otherwise the problems we've witnessed will pile higher and higher and higher. President Officer, I want to see all our public sector staff paid fairly. The pay cap has hit people in many areas, including local government, the police, fire eh, service, etc. And the government can act when it wants to. Let me publicly commend the Prison Officers Association for securing what was called a one-off £2,000 increase for pay prison officers in 2015. It seems like one-off has a flexible meaning, just as once in a generation does where this government is concerned, as that deal has been repeated again this year. As I say, I congratulate the POA. But what about the other staff in the prison service? No 2000 for them. What about staff in local government and our councils? No 2000 for them. You must come what to about post, NHS please. staff? No 2000 for them. These public sector workers deliver the services that civilise our society. I support the call for an end to the pay gap and I support the motion put forward by Nas Sarwar. Marie Todd to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I remind the chamber that I'm a qualified pharmacist registered with the General Pharmaceutical Council. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this debate because until my election last year, as many of you know, I worked as a hospital pharmacist, one of the many staff groups paid under Agenda for Change. Each year, the NHS peer review body made a recommendation on how much my salary should rise, although several times in the last few years, with it being a below inflation settlement since I was at the top of my pay band, I would agree it's incorrect to describe it as a rise. The Scottish Government has honoured the review body advice every year, something my colleagues here in Scotland were very thankful for. My colleagues south of the border in England have not been so lucky. The Westminster Government has not passed on the increase in several years. This has led to a marked difference in salaries between the two countries, with Scottish Band 5 staff being paid up to £312 more than their English and Welsh counterpart. 
parts. The difference is even more stark at lower bands, where over and above the pay recommendations due to Scottish Government action for the lowest paid entry level, NHS support staff in Scotland are paid more than £1,128 more than their counterparts in England. The reality in the UK today is that nurses, junior doctors and care workers all get paid more in Scotland than in England. Now, as you might expect, given my background, I do believe that NHS staff should be paid more. But I wonder if that is possible, given the budget cuts coming from Westminster. Along with many of my colleagues in the NHS, I know that the NHS in Scotland is relatively well, well protected behind a government that is committed to a publicly run service free at the point of care. Of course, the austerity agenda supported by the Tories and their coalition partners, the Liberal Democrats, have cut public spending and that has an impact on the Scottish Government's budget by reducing the block grant. Yes, I'll take an intervention. Alex, right. excuse me, Mr Cole Hamilton. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Sorry. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful for Marie Todd for finally taking an intervention. I wonder if, even through her ultra-loyalist prism for the uh, SNP government, that to describe her colleagues as being grateful for the miserly increase we've seen under this government, that she does actually belie the statistics and the research of the Royal College of Nurses in this country. Marie Todd. As I've said before, I suspect that if that research, that survey had been conducted on a country individual country exactly. case within the UK, I think we would have got very different results. The Institute for Fiscal Studies has said spending growth on the NHS under your coalition government was the lowest five-year average since records began, although that was generous compared with the cuts in spending to other government departments over the same period. Given this constrained budget, the Scottish Government have to be congratulated for not only managing to increase pay in Scotland, but also they have ensured that there have been no compulsory redundancies. They have maintained free nurse student bursaries in Scotland. They have maintained free nurse student tuition. Not only that, they have created the discretionary, discretionary hardship fund. This has not happened in England. So the number of English applicants to nursing courses has plummeted by 23% as a result, whilst being substantially maintained in Scotland. That may be why the current vac nurse vacancy rate in England is 9%, compared with 4% in Scotland, where wage increases have been more generous. There has been increasing policy divergence between the NHS in Scotland and the NHS in England, and it is making it much harder to sustain a UK-wide perspective of the NHS workforce. I have already mentioned some areas of divergence. The Conservative amendment raises another, the level of spend on agency and locum staff. My Conservative colleagues will no doubt welcome the fact that NHS Scotland has a nationally coordinated programme for the effective management of all temporary staffing. The team are working to establish regional and national staff banks to allow boards access to high quality, flexible workforce of appropriately qualified, experienced and competent staff when it's required, who all work on NHS contracts and provide better value for money than alternative methods of filling the gaps. My Conservative colleagues will also no doubt be pleased to hear that NHS Scotland spends proportionately a third of what is spent in NHS England on medical and nursing agency staff. Some other areas of divergence we might want to consider are Scotland outperforms all other UK countries on the four-hour A&E target. Scotland outperforms on delayed discharges too. There's been an increase of 11% in England because of a lack of investment in social care. In Scotland, that figure has decreased by 9% because of the contrasting policy. Scotland has consistently spent more per person on health than England since at least 2009-10. Scotland has a higher clinical the members coming to a close per capita than England, so more doctors, more nurses and more midwives work here in NHS Scotland thanks to the SNP government's sound management of the NHS. 
You no. must come to a close. I want to finish with a wee mention of this evening's mem members' debate, secured by my colleague Emma Harper, MSP, you who must is also come to a, a nurse. Close, please, Ms. Later Todd. this week, we celebrate International Nurses' Day, and over many mm. years of working in a Ms. hospital, Miss Todd, you really must close. I am finishing. It's my last sentence. I have worked with some awesome nurses. Ms. I am Todd, sure they will be pleased to know that I am still working. You with awesome are nurses finished your place. contribution. Thank you. And I have Alexander Stewart, who is followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and also thank Labour for bringing this topic to the Chamber today. As we know, the challenge facing the NHS has been described as a perfect storm. Funding, structure and culture. Recently, the Scottish Conservatives constructed a 15-point action plan highlighting a myriad of areas in which there is a massive scope for improvement even with a demanding and rising ageing population. The action plan highlighted a multifaceted problem that faces the NHS, Deputy Presiding Officer. Staffing is the key to managing its funding and this is where huge cracks have begun to appear. My mother has uh, been a district nurse, midwife and health visitor who gave decades of support uh, to the NHS. Uh, she had drive uh, to support patients in dignity from birth to death was exceptional. And she gave her working life to caring in the community. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. Wastage, overspending and delays still continue to blight the NHS in its day-to-day -day operations. And this is one area of where we can look at looking at efficiencies and improvements and they can yield savings. Funding in the NHS in Scotland was roughly flat uh, for the real terms during 2008-9 uh, and that has seen uh, a, a huge impact uh, across uh, the pace. Deputy Presiding Officer, despite moves towards integration, the NHS is still broadly based on a traditional model. Uh, and, and we acknowledge that and we see that. Uh, we do have uh, social care and reliant on primary and secondary care. And I'd like to pay tribute to all the staff who play a vital role in this sector. Their dedication, their enthusiasm and their commitment knows no bounds. And our NHS staff are the envy of the world. And that's because of their dedication, their commitment and their enthusiasm. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, staff feel disengaged from reforms. Uh, they also uh, look at uh, the workload basis, uh, and if they are not managing that effectively and efficiently, then they feel stressed and overworked. Uh, there are still far too many managers within our NHS, and that system is causing unnecessary creation of unnecessary tiers of management, and these problems are all linked. Pay, Training and support is vital to ensure that the staff feel valued within our NHS. If clinicians feel alienated from management reforms which are taking place, then the pressures that they face uh, continue to move forward and continue to grow. Staff feel engaged if they are effective uh, and, and they see uh, better ways of managing things and in turn uh, reducing pressures on the workforce will ensure that we have better outcomes for our patients. And all of that is exactly what we want to see within our NHS system. Uh, and I believe that is happening the length and breadth of this country because of the dedication of the staff staff that work within our NHS. We know that we are dealing with an ageing population and we understand uh, the demographics that are facing us, the bed blocking that takes place and all of the other aspects that fall into place to ensure that we do have issues to manage. And at the end of the day, uh, we have to manage the finances to ensure uh, that the budgets work effectively uh, and the individuals can work within these constraints. The whole situation is quite complex, Deputy Presiding Officer, but alone it is not the fact that we have to see that the SNP are spending millions of pounds on private health firms. In 2015-16 alone, 14 uh, of the health boards have spent £51.6 million on private operations because NHS hospitals could not cope with the demand. I, I, I want to make some more progress. Time is tight. The government is also paying millions of pounds on agency staff and agency doctors and nurses in the system. And that has a, a huge knock-on effect uh, as we go forward. For 10 years, the SNP have been running the health service in Scotland. And staff morale is, we are told, at the lowest ebb. They are failing their staff, le letting uh, them be left behind and left out. So this government has a track record, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, where they are looking at what, what the staff is achieving and not going forward. I want to try and make some progress. 
we also have to think about what, what we're doing when it comes to my own region uh, in, in Mid Scotland and Fife. Uh, now, Tayside, uh, Fife, uh, and Forth Valley have all had issues uh, with reference to staffing levels uh, and morale uh, and targets that have been set by this government, and they have, they have uh, failed to achieve many of them as we've gone forward. Much of this is unsustainable, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ensure that we do have a workforce that's fit for purpose and going forward. And even with new systems that the, they're bringing in, like NHS 24, the IT system uh, is 73% is, is uh, over budget and more than four years overdue. We have a lack of staff within the system and the SNP are not tackling the issue, they're actually adding to the issue and adding to the complexities that we face within this problem. Uh, as I say, technological glitches have been reported by staff who are struggling to cope in many hospitals across, this, uh, across uh, Scotland. Uh, and some are, 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 are saying that low, low morale, staff vacancies, staff sickness and staff stress uh, are adding to uh, and compounding what's taking place uh, within our NHS. Deputy Presiding Officer, NHS requires certainty as it moves forward. The Scottish Conservative Party have recommended that the NHS needs to invest now in dramatic service change, which will have a positive knock-on effect uh, and ensure that we do have a, a, a way of managing our finances. And also the national working uh, planning must be addressed by this government. They cannot continue to sweep it under the carpet. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer... Yeah, a quick Officer, conclusion, please. This, is, this will go some way to making the changes that we require uh, to revitalise. I pay tribute to the NH staff, but I do not pay tribute to the Scottish Government who have looked over this for 10 years in decline and decay. I support the motion, uh, the amendment in my uh, member's name. Thank you, Deputy President. The last of the speeches in the open debate is Emma Harper. Wow, presiding officer, thank you very much. I am looking forward to speaking in this debate this afternoon. And I do thank Anna Sarwar for his opening comments about his own family experience. And I'm sure everyone in the chamber, as James Dornan noted, um, has a ex direct experience of the NHS and interaction with the NHS. I must remind chamber that I am a nurse and I am also a member of the Royal College of Nursing. And there's one thing we can agree on across this chamber today that it, nurses should be paid more and this evening I will lead a members debate um, celebrating International Nurses Day because I think we should shout louder about the invaluable work that nurses do here in Scotland and internationally often in very difficult circumstances and of course I think this should be reflected in their pay and conditions. But do the Labour Party ever ask themselves why we can't pay nurses as well as we would like in Scotland? I have some bad news for the Labour benches. When you don't fully control your own budget, neither do you fully control the pay and conditions of NHS staff. I believe this point has been made to them before. The Scottish Government has managed to maintain record levels of investment in NHS Scotland while withstanding cuts to the block grant. Funding constraints on the NHS are the direct result of Westminster's austerity agenda. Yes, I will. Neil Finlay. We appear to control our budget enough to pay prison officers more. Why can that not apply to nurses? Emma Harper. I thank Mr Finlay for that intervention. I think, you know, the whole understanding of this process and just raising taxes and looking at the whole aspects of how we look at the salary and the banding and the whole NHS, you know, in my experience, in my experience as a nurse who's worked 33 years and the most recent 14 in the NHS, I think I see staff struggle with the workload every day and... As a nurse educator, part of my duties were to support efficiently working and recognise people when they're under stress, like I am right now. And I want to make sure that I get this on the record. I hear what you're saying. My colleagues would love a pay rise. But how can we do that with the constraints that we are being put under by the constant austerity measures of the Tory government? Will the 
Sure. Marie Todd. Thank you. I'm sure that all of us in this chamber will welcome the fact that whilst many people have expressed concern about staff satisfaction in the NHS, we do have a very high level of patient satisfaction in the NHS and many of our nursing workforce are to be congratulated for that. So we have a record high of 90%, the highest ever since records began in terms of inpatient survey um, satisfaction and we also have in the Scottish um, Social Attitudes Survey the highest rate of confidence in the NHS in the last 10 years. We have another couple of minutes, Ms Harper. Thank you, Marie, for that intervention. The Royal College of Nursing actually do state in their briefing that pay awards for the NHS, NHS staff have been constrained by the UK government's policy on public sector since 2011. It should be noted, though, that the Scottish government has implemented recommendations made by the pay review body to date. So every year, as the pay review is processed, the Scottish Government takes on board these recommendations. I would like to appreciate you know, the scrutiny of the Government's policies, and I think that is a role that all the opposition parties need to do, me included as a backbencher. But it's the role of the opposition parties to come to the Chamber ready with an approach that might support the NHS in a balanced, fair and level-headed manner. The 1% rise in Scotland is further supplemented by the Scottish Government's measures for the lowest paid, like a flat rate of £400 uplift for anyone earning £22,000 or less. In Scotland, entry-level nursing support or NHS support, they get paid an extra £1,128 more per year than their English counterparts. For me, my, my, one of my colleagues was at a recruitment event and said that nurses are leaving NHS England and coming to Dumfries and Galloway to get better pay and better work conditions because they see what's happening in NHS England. So I welcome those nurses from England. Come and work in Scotland and we will look after you. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Miles Briggs up to six minutes, please, Mr Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to close this debate on the NHS for the Scottish Conservatives. Since being elected, it's been a pleasure to meet with and learn from many of those people who work in our health service day in, day out. Their commitment and work ethic is what drives them each day and I want to thank them and pay tribute to their dedication as a number of members have done uh, to, in today's debate. One message which they've told me directly is that the decline in the performance of our NHS in Scotland hasn't just been a recent thing. It started whilst the Labour Party were in charge in health in this Parliament. Over the 10 years the Labour Party were in power in the Scottish Parliament, waiting times increased dramatically. Drug-related deaths and methadone scripts skyrocketed, and Scotland had the highest prevalence of hospital superbugs in Europe, not to mention Labour's own hospital closure plans. We all have our own personal stories to tell about how NH the NHS and those who work in it have helped us and given us love and support and the amazing nurses which work throughout our health service. But what really struck me from today's debate was the fact that no Labour speaker wanted to actually justify what they do when they are in power and is certainly their record in Wales. After all, Wales is the only part of the United Kingdom where the, where the Labour Party have been in consistent, unbroken control of our health service since 1997, over two decades. No, I want you to listen to this, Mr Finlay. And looking at the NHS in Wales, it is little wonder Labour MSPs want to actually have that record discussed today. In Wales, for example, the Welsh Labour Party have not introduced the pays, pay rise which they are proposing today. Your colleagues who are in power are not doing what you are proposing. Waiting times in Wales are at their highest and patients are having to be sent to England. No, thank you. Patients are having to be sent to England, Mr Finlay, for emergency treatment. That's your record in power in Wales. In fact, analysis shows that on average patients in Wales have to wait five weeks longer for treatment than they do in England. Labour have imposed record-breaking budget cuts and presided over the poorest access to cancer treatments anywhere in the UK, downgrading hospitals across Wales. And I think it's a scandal today 
that in Wales, the Labour government haven't met their cancer waiting targets since 2008. Mr Welsh Briggs, Labour, Mr. Briggs yes. may I intervene and ask you to address what's happened in the debate this afternoon? Thank you. Thank you. This is Labour's record on the NHS, and it's certainly not one to be proud of. And here in Scotland, we're still seeing the impact of this. Labour's use of financial, uh, private finance initiatives, for example, have seen new hospitals built at taxpayer expense of 7.8 billion. Hospitals such as Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, which cost 180 million pounds to build, but will cost the taxpayer 1.6 billion pounds by the end of 2030. I don't think that's right. And James Dornan tried to make the point about the cost of um, NHS staff parking, and that's a key issue, I think, to the cost they are facing. This is, I believe it's an ongoing scandal that car parking charges are as high as they are in Edinburgh. And I've been pleased to support the campaign alongside NHS staff, patients, visitors and the Edinburgh Evening News at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. NHS Lothian and the private company running the car park at the ERI... Excuse me, Mr Briggs. I, I think um, the presiding officer earlier made a ruling on car parking. And I would ask that you address the debate that has taken place and indeed the motion and amendments that were put forward. I think it was an important point we were all making as members that actually these costs impact on people's lives and their living costs and travelling and working to hospital is something which many nurses have told me is a significant amount. Certainly when that increase was Mr. proposed... Mr Briggs, to 70 to 50 I days, did ask you to move on to address the motion and the amendments and indeed the debate that had taken place, taking indeed. due cognizance of what my colleague in the chair earlier said. I will indeed. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Of course, we all agree that everyone in our NHS staff deserves to be respected and valued and be able to work in a positive and safe environment. Something which I'm sorry to say the Health Committee has heard is not always the case in the NHS. And NHS staff being bullied and often do not feel they're being listened to. My colleague Donald Cameron has laid out the, NHS, the SNP's failure to improve our health service over the last 10 years. Scotland's NHS has declined on, their watch, on the watch of the SNP and major reforms are clearly required. The SNP have taken decisions on hospital closures and service redesign, such as the closure, closure of Edinburgh Cleft Lip and Palate Surgery Unit, against clear evidence, and this has impacted on our staff. As Brian Whittle set out, a radical culture change is indeed needed and required. Working for our NHS must become an attractive and valued career path again, especially in rural areas and areas such as general practice, which is struggling to attract graduates. Staff shortages are widespread, with over 2,500 vacant nursing and midwifery posts. Spending on agency staff has increased dramatically, and nearly a quarter of a billion of pounds is now being spent in Scotland on locum staff. We not only have an ageing population, we also have an ageing NHS workforce. And returning to the culture change needed within the NHS, Unnecessary A&E visits are costing NHS Scotland at least £33 million a year. Only this week, the Health and Sport Committee learned about the triaging work being undertaken by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to help take pressure off A&E units. I welcome this. These are the sorts of reforms which would and can make a real difference to the performance of our NHS and give NHS staff the professional responsibilities which they're desperate to have. Our NHS should rightly be an institution to be proud of rather than one constantly on the brink of crisis. It should be an organisation that values every member of staff and all those who care for us. Enabling our workforce to do their jobs and deliver high quality must care come to a close, please. is something we must all work towards. Today's debate has failed Mr. to actually Briggs, say where the come will come close. from. Until Labour can answer these Mr. Briggs, questions, would you please sit down? Serious. Thank you. Can I remind members across the chamber that when I ask people to close the debate there's the, with their contribution, there's a reason for that. There are time constraints and I expect that to be complied with. And can I now move on to Shona Robson to close the debate up to, up to seven minutes, please, Ms Robson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to start on a, a point of agreement uh, that's come out of the debate this afternoon, and that is that we all care about the NHS and the staff uh, that work within it and no one and no party has a, a monopoly on that so perhaps we can start with that point of agreement I was I thought Anna Sarwar and indeed Monica Lennon gave um, a very powerful and personal testimony of their own uh, family's uh, support from the NHS and Monica Lennon talked about the, the high 
level of care that uh, her family had received and we would expect nothing less. Similarly, uh, my family have in uh, recent months received the same uh, level of care and for every individual nurse and healthcare worker and porter and everybody else, I want to thank each and every one of them uh, from the bottom of my heart and assure as everybody has done in the chamber this afternoon. I want to try and address as many points as I can uh, that have been raised this afternoon on workforce, which uh, a number of members have raised. And first of all, you know, I have said in this chamber time and time again, I don't run away from the challenges that the health service has. And although we do have uh, record levels of staffing, 3,400 whole-time equivalent, more nursing and midwifery staff in our NHS compared to five years ago. The demands on our NHS continue to rise. And of course, uh, in terms of vacancy levels, as members have raised, yes, they are too high, standing at 4.1% uh, in December of last year. Uh, and that is something we are working very hard with boards uh, to address. Similarly, on agency spend, again, something that a number of members have mentioned, uh, agency spend is too high, which is why, as members have mentioned, we have a national programme to reduce agency spend. But there is a context to that. Combined medical and nursing agency costs represent 2% of the overall staffing spend, and agency nursing represents 0.4% of the total nursing and midwifery uh, staffing in the NHS. Now, that's too high, but we have to see the context to that. And, of course, it is still less than when we uh, took power back in 2007. And, indeed, as many members have pointed out, we have maintained things like the student-nurse uh, bursary, which has meant that we've seen uh, still a high level of interest in people coming in to our, our nursing and midwifery courses compared to where the bursary has been removed south of the border, seeing a 23% decrease in uh, student nurse applications. I think that is something uh, that uh, is going to store up a whole heap of trouble and difficulties for the NHS south of the border. And I think that has been perhaps one of the defining issues here in this debate this afternoon and, and let me say to all members I have no difficulty with anybody from whatever side of this chamber criticising the record of uh, my government uh, in power that's what you are here uh, to do however what is also I think a little disappointing in these debates is that in nowhere in for example Anna Sarwar's speech or Monica Lennon's speech or anybody else from the Labour benches was there any recognition that pay rates are indeed higher in Scotland, that the Scottish Government has taken action to address low pay, that we still have nurse bursaries, student bursaries, that we have a no compulsory redundancy policy. All of these things I would have thought would have merited a mention in one of the Labour speeches, but not one mention of any of that. And I think that shows a complete lack of balance. I accept criticism, but occasionally it would be good to get recognition of some of the good things that are happening uh, that the Scottish Government has brought in, just occasionally to bring balance to these debates. Yes, of course. Anna Sarwar. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking intervention. I do recognise those things on a, on a point of balance, but in, I'll do it now just to, so the Cabinet Secretary can say that we are pleased that those things have happened in Scotland. But will she at the same time also recognise that in her own submission to the independent peer review body that she submitted that we should have a 1% pay cap for NHS staff this year? Shona Robinson, the Scottish Government put in was a balanced submission around pay, about progression, around tackling low pay and many of the other things that nurses tell me are important. It's not just about pay, it's about all of those other things. And we are constrained, as many members have said, by the Treasury um, and all roads effectively lead back to the Treasury in terms of what the independent pay review body can do. And I thought Alison Johnson made an important point here. And she leaves, I, I guess, a choice for us to make. Because if we are part of the independent pay review body, then that is the recommendation that we will have to implement. Otherwise, why are we part of it? 
If we want to have Scottish negotiating machinery, then that is something I am more than happy to talk to the unions and staff side about. At the moment, they do not agree that that's the direction of travel that we should have. Some of them do, some of them don't. And we need to get agreement across all of the unions and staff side about that way forward. And if that's the way we want to go, then that is something I will support. I also want to touch on something that Richard Lennon said. Len Lennon, maybe Freudian slip. Uh, Richard Leonard said. Uh, I see you looking very proud. <laughs> but he, he, said, he said something that I thought was quite interesting and, and something I think Labour will have to uh, uh, clarify, perhaps, in the winding up speech here today. Because he seemed, seemed to indicate that Labour's position on partnership working had changed and that they no longer supported partnership working. He talked about unions should be free to negotiate uh, out with the partnership arrangements. I'm paraphrasing, but essentially that is the point he made. Really? So you don't want employee directors no longer to sit on boards, having an equal voice around that table, representing the staff side. You no one longer want partnership forums to be in absolutely the heart of decision making within our NHS. You see, the unions like partnership working because it delivers for them in a way that it isn't delivered out in the rest of these islands. So I think the unions will be very interested to hear your comments about partnership working and perhaps Labour can clarify whether indeed that's something they no longer uh, support. Uh, you must uh, close Cabinet Secretary. Yeah. Uh, can I say to the rest of the, the members, I'm sorry I haven't been able to come back uh, on their comments, but we have a plan we have the delivery plan, a comprehensive blueprint for the NHS. We will get on uh, through that. We will work with staff. I will address pay and all the other concerns that staff have raised, not just you about must pay, close, with please. the unions when I meet them in the next few weeks. And I call on Colin Smith to close this debate. Up to nine minutes, please, Mr Smith. Th thank you, President Officer. Next year, we'll celebrate the 70th anniversary of Labour's greatest achievement, our National Health Service. The founding principle that no matter your class, your race, your age or your wealth, you should be entitled to quality health care free at the point of use is as precious today as it was when Nye Bevan established the NHS in 1948. But nearly 70 years on, equally precious is the principle that if we want high quality health care, we need to value the staff who we entrust to deliver that care. As Richard Leonard said, the foundation stone of the NHS is not medical equipment or pharmaceutical formulas, but the skill and dedication of the people who work in the service. Today, Parliament has the opportunity to match that principle and those words with our actions, to show that we're on the side of the nurses, the doctors, the allied healthcare staff who look after our loved ones as if they were their own. Now, many members have taken the opportunity during today's debate to pay tribute to the commitment and dedication of our amazing NHS staff. We heard personal stories from Monica Lennon, Anas Sarwa and Shona Robinson. Rightly so. But we know that the best way we can support and repay those staff is, as Alex Cole Hamilton said, providing them with adequate investment in our workforce. What those staff need is decent pay and conditions. What they want is adequate staffing levels. But as speaker after speaker have rightly highlighted, we do not have those adequate staffing levels. Instead, we have a recruitment and retention crisis across our NHS. One in four of our GP practices reports a vacancy. And we have a ticking time bomb of GPs queuing up to retire. The Royal College of General Practitioners predict that by 2020, Scotland will have a GP shortfall of nearly 830 just to bring coverage per head of population back to the level we had in 2009. But the crisis is not just in GP numbers. There are more than 2,500 nursing and midwifery vacancies, four times higher than the 660 in 2011. And nearly 750 of those posts have been lying vacant for three months or more, a rise of 300% since the SNP formed a majority government in 2011. The consequence of these high vacancy rates and of training posts going unfilled is an increase in the burdens on existing staff, adding to their already unsustainable workloads. Yet, the Scottish Government have continued to impose a pay policy that means someone entering nursing today is in real terms worse off than someone entering nursing seven years ago. A real terms cut in the value of their starting salary that will make it more difficult to attract the new nurses, the new doctors and the new allied health professionals we so badly need in our health service. 
As an Ash Sarwar outlined, independent analysis by the Scottish Parliament Information Centre shows what this means for those staff. If nurses pay had simply stayed in line with inflation over the past seven years, so not even a real terms increase, the band fine starting point in April 2017 would be 25,839. Instead, it is 22,440. In Excuse words, me, Mr Smith. There's far too much background noise going on. Could we please have some courtesy for Mr Smith? In other words, a nurse starting salary today is £3,400 less in real terms than a nurse starting salary in April 2010 under this government. That's an undeniable fact. It's just disappointing that listening to some SNP contributions today, they're in denial over the impact this has on recruitment. Their argument seems to be it's fine because it's a little bit better for agenda for change staff at pay bands 49 in Scotland than it is in England. Well, it's touching to hear SNP members today who want to break up the UK and have nothing to do with the NHS in England or Wales or Northern Ireland to suddenly shed crocodile tears for nurses in other parts of the UK. The irony is lost on SNP member after member who had more to say about England and Wales than they did to say about Scotland when they want to walk away from England and Wales. I have, to say, I have to say, if the height of the SNP's aim is to be a little less uncaring than Tory Health Minister Philip Hammond, then frankly, it's time they raised their ambitions. It's an approach, I have to say, that was only surpassed by Miles Briggs, who we thought was trying to walk out of this parliament by standing for Westminster, when it seems he's actually making a bid for the Welsh Assembly. <laughs> I know the SNP, SNP saying an amendment today that, quote, the best resolution will be found by the Scottish Government working in partnership with NHS staff representative. It calls on, and I quote again, the Scottish Government to seek agreement with the staff side through the representatives and unions. Well, I haven't finished that point, but I'll give way, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you uh, for giving way. Uh, I just wonder if you could clarify Labour's position on partnership working. Does Labour support partnership working or does it not? Is partnership working if we can deliver the pay rise that we want to see for all staff right across the UK? And that's what will be contained within the Labour Party's manifesto at this next election. Now, the SNP amendment talks about working jointly with the unions and representatives to commission work to develop an evidence base to assess the impact of pay restraint, using this evidence as part of the submission to the next pay round of the NHS Independent Pay Review Body. President officer, I have to say it's a bit rich of the Scottish Government to talk about joint submissions with staff to next year's pay review body when their own submission to this year's pay review body went against those staff and actually argued for a real terms pay cut. As Alison Johnson pointed out, the pay review body based the recommendations on the pay policy of the government. The reality is evidence is already here in this year's staff side submission to show the impact of pay restraint. The 44 page submission to the NHS pay review body for 2017-18 states that public sector pay restraint has clearly damaged both the finances and morale. It goes on to say, and I quote again, that unless action is taken now, minimum wage levels will overtake agenda for change pay points. And it states this can only be avoided by a significant pay increase. If that evidence isn't enough for the Scottish Government, they should read rather than try to rubbish the Royal College of Nursing's most recent employment survey of its members, which found that 30 per cent struggle to pay gas and electricity bills, 14 per cent miss meals because of financial difficulties, 53 per cent have been compelled to work extra hours to increase earnings, and 32 per cent were working extra nights and weekend shifts just to make everyday living expenses. This corresponds with a year-on-year -year increase of 30 per cent over the past five years in the number of RCN members having to seek specialist money advice from their union's welfare service. Many more are borrowing money to meet essential costs like childcare or taking second jobs. And some are having to use food banks to feed their families. Yes, food banks. Maybe that's what Donald Cameron meant about supporting nurses in other ways rather than giving them a pay rise. No wonder nurses in Scotland are being balloted on industrial action to try to end this pay cap. Yes, nurses in Scotland, before any more SNP member tries to pretend this isn't an issue for nurses here. President officer, we don't need to wait until next year to see the evidence of the impact of the pay cap. It is there before our eyes. It's just the Scottish Government is ignoring it. It has the power to make different decisions, as it rightly did with prison officers. It has the power to be more progressive 
than the Tories. But as usual, it has chosen not to use those powers and therefore not to support Scotland's health care workforce. Now, the SNP amendment does make one valid point on the impact of Brexit. Scotland's health and social care sector employs around 12,000 EU nationals. We know that parts of the sector simply would not function without their contribution. Yet Theresa May and the Tory government shamefully won't make a commitment to protect the status of each and every one of those EU nationals. The truth is, despite their anti-immigration rhetoric, if you go into hospital, we're more likely to come across a migrant caring for us than a migrant lying in the next bed. Not content with mis misleading us with their false claims on the back of a big red bus that the NHS would receive an extra £350 million a week if we left the EU, the Tory hard Brexiteers are now shamefully using EU nationals working in our NHS like poker chips in their negotiations. It's sickening, it's wrong and it needs to stop. But let's be clear, the staffing crisis our NHS faces is with us right here and right now, even before the hard Brexiters have their way. The SNP amendment is full of warm words, but is as cold as the Tory amendment by its failure to address the crisis. Like the Tory amendment, it won't put a single penny in the pocket of nurses struggling to pay the bills. It won't contribute to the recruitment of a single new doctor. So we have a clear choice when we come to vote shortly. This Parliament can choose to be on the side of our NHS workforce, to choose to say to the Scottish Government it's time to scrap the cap, time to vote to give our hard-pressed NHS staff a well-deserved pay rise and begin to tackle the recruitment and retention crisis. Or it can choose to vote to continue austerity, to say that nurses going to food banks is acceptable. Labour knows which side we are on, the side of the NHS. That concludes our debate on Scrap the NHS pay cap. We now move on to the next item of business. And I would ask, uh, sorry, the next item of business is consideration of business motion 5517 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 5517. Moved. Thank you. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. The question is that motion 5517 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of uh, Parliamentary Bureau motion 5521. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 5521 on committee meetings. Moved. Thank you very much. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Shona Robinson is agreed, the amendment in the name of Donald Cameron falls. The first question is that Amendment 5479.3, in the name of Shona Robison, which seeks to amend Motion 5479, in the name of Anas Sarwar, on Scrap the NHS Pay Cap, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll have a division, and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 5479.3 in the name of Shuna Robison is yes 62, no 55. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The amendment in the name of Donald Cameron is therefore preempted. The next question is that motion 5479 in the name of Anas Sawar as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion 5479 in the name of Anas Sawar as amended is yes 62, no 55. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. 
And the final question is that motion 5521 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee meeting be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Emma Harper on celebrating International Nurses' Day. And we'll just take a few moments to change seats.